What's up, guys? It's yo boy I'm the Sensei. Welcome to a new series, Star Wars. Reborn as Anakin Skywalker. Part 1. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Consider joining my Patreon to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, is this is this happening now, or in the future? Thousands of years before the Galactic Republic, at a time of great peril during the Mandalorian Wars a GD Master had foreseen something, something of terrible greatness, or great terribleness. Either way, it was a sight to behold. GD Master Canilia had a force vision. A vision that included a man dressed in a suit of all black, a man who had become entrapped within the corrupting dark side of the force. It also included the figures of three others, less important than the man in black, but there nonetheless. All four beings would be affected by the Sith artifact known as the Muir Talisman. Similarly, at an unknown period of time, another vision was also foretold by the Hindsnake cult. An ancient sect the members of which wielded a dark and powerful magic, capable of rivaling the Dark Lords of the Sith and clouding their vision. A vision that would declare an end to both the Jedi Order and the Empire, and leave the galaxy in eternal chaos. Fast forward a few thousand years into present day. The enigmatic Sith Lords of the current times, Darth Plagueis and his Sith apprentice Darth Sidious, were trying something amazing. Extremely dangerous but nonetheless terrifying. Everything done here has been for a single purpose. To extend our reign indefinitely. Darth Plagueis had said to his apprentice. Repeatedly had Plagueis destroyed his rival, Darth Venomous. A male Bith, he was the Sith apprentice of the Dark Lord, Darth Tenebris. Tenebris trained Venomous in violation of the Rule of Two, since he had another apprentice, Darth Plagueis. Despite Venomous's use of the Sith title, Darth, it was not legitimately bestowed upon him. And finally his life had come to an end, by my hand did I complete the rules and uphold the rule of two. Plagueis thought to himself darkly. Sidious, his apprentice and the blasted droid 114D, had been witness to his violation and torture of his rival. Cruel and gruesome was the outcome, but the Sith way it was. To say that the Force works in mysterious ways is to admit one's ignorance, for any mystery can be solved through the application of knowledge and unrelenting effort. As we had our way with the Senate, and as we will soon have our way with the Republic and the Jedi, we will have our way with the Force. Plagueis says to Sidious before continuing. We will now enter a deep meditative state. Come with me my apprentice. Yes master. Sidious and Plagueis then entered a meditative trance, and managed to tip the scales of balance in the favor of darkness. Plagueis attempted to go one step further, and attempted to create life by mentally reaching out to the inhabitants of the galaxy. An act in direct violation of the nature of the Force, Plagueis and Sidious, attempted to will a being of their own design into creation, pouring their malicious intent into waves through the Force to the countless midi-chlorians spread across the galaxy. All things come at a price, but it would seem that my actions taken have not resulted in a negative income. Plagueis thought to himself. I will have to constantly put my theories to the test to see what is right and what is wrong about the Force. The experiment did not yield fruit, however, as Plagueis perceived the Force growing silent to his probing. Immediately afterwards, Plagueis' test subjects began to succumb to various diseases, and he set most of the survivors free, some of the animals he had experimented on adapted to the forests of Sojourn. Plagueis had developed a theory that the Force was actively opposed to the Sith's efforts, and he saw each setback in this light. These events took place in the year prior to the birth of the Chosen One. A strange occurrence was happening just off of the ship that was owned by some slavers. If one was to slow down time and take a closer look at the orbiting light, one would see it was composed of an immaterial substance or energy in a glow of grey color. Its shape is that of a small orb and has no distinguishing features. The orbiting light circling the planet is also waiting. Waiting for a moment to ensure its survival and maybe even an eventual increase in potential power. This power being the potential from the human woman known as Shmai Skywalker, the woman that would be the mother of one of the most powerful or potentially most powerful force user of the Star Wars universe. Anakin Skywalker, otherwise known as Darth Vader in an alternate reality. The destined chosen one meant to put an end to the Sith and bring balance to the Force. The orb of light is an expectant soul in waiting to be reincarnated as that very person, with no knowledge that the universe he was to reborn in, will not be the same he has originally come to know of. The grey orb also does not know of the changes that has happened or will happen for his new body, or of what new abilities he would have access that another Anakin would not. The very year, the very year nothing of importance has happened, and nothing much more of importance will happen until a virgins in the Force is made. Shmai Skywalker has mysteriously come upon the condition known as pregnancy. As to how one could conceive a child by oneself when she does not have the physical capabilities to asexually reproduce is strange. Some would say she is lying about the fact that she has not been romantically involved with a man, or even involved with another in an adult fashion. 
More so considering that she is a slave, and one would think her current owner would not permit something like this to happen. Despite as to how she has come upon being pregnant, one cannot get around the fact that she is. Various tests were conducted, but no answer could be concluded by the medical droids. The day had come. Today is the day a new life is brought into the world. Anakin, Anakin Skywalker. Usually the day a new life is brought into the galaxy would be celebrated by a life form's relatives and extended family or friends. Unfortunately the circumstances of the birth of Anakin Skywalker is not something to be all too happy about. Being born into slavery is definitely not something to be celebrated, but should be of great tragedy. Despite this the event that transpired happens not only to the newborn Anakin, it also happens to other unfortunate souls. Parents, family and others that would come together to celebrate a new life, unfortunately could not be given for Anakin. Different from most babies that would breathe and cry within a few seconds of being born, the infant Anakin only silently adjusted to his new surroundings, free from the constraint of the womb. That was an experience. The gift of life, that keeps on giving. Apparently it has decided to give me another chance. The last thing I remember was his thoughts interrupted by a soft feminine voice, which also causes confusion at the name easily identified using his memories as the name of Darth Vader from the Star Wars universe. His name will be Anakin, Anakin Skywalker. Did she just say Anakin? Why would anyone from normal the 21st century name their child Anakin? Through small silted eyelids, the perspective shown as if the world is an amalgamation of colors that consist of grays, whites, blacks, and tiny button-like reds, blues and greens. Everything is so blurry. The sounds and light is giving me a headache, it also does not help that my nervous system is currently sending signals all over screaming pain. Medical droids in the background making a few muffled sounds and the squeaking jingles of mechanical parts, moving about in various locations around a white tinted room covered and illuminated by bright lights. The voice transmitting itself over an intercom speaks in a deep but weirdly high-pitched voice in a language unknown that sounded a bit comedic to the infant Anakin. Time to go. Be fast with the slave woman and boy. The medical droids hastily sped up with what they are doing. Quickly going through the motions and preparing to cut the already long operation shorter as to not displease their masters. The woman looks troubled from her expression, but complies with the words spoken by her current slave master, and with the droids whom hasten her along as well. What's happening now? Well, I have no choice but to accept my current situation. A few days had passed, and the entity that has now adopted the name Anakin Skywalker, has finally come to terms with his current predicament. I didn't exactly want to be reborn as Anakin, let alone as Anakin and a baby. At least I have a chance to avoid being being implanted with a slave chip. Despite only existing within this universe for a mere few days, the possibilities and potential of the universe he is in, made him excited to fully explore the power of the Force, technology and other aspects of the Star Wars universe. Of course, at the top of my priorities is the growth of my power, whether that be the Force itself or through other means, and woes to say this universe I am in is the exact same as canon Star Wars. There could be a whole lot more things to discover, a lot more ways to gain power. Other priorities include learning the languages of this vast galaxy, and educating myself on various subjects. Every so often medical droids would pass by, checking and doing various tests on children within the futuristic baby ward. I am surprised original Anakin did not have his midi-chlorians checked to see if he was force-sensitive by the droids, but then again, it may not matter that much to the HUD empire at large. Various machinery that looks like monitors shows many words unknown to the boy and many more symbols and numbers. First things first, I guess it is time to practice meditation and see if I can start using the legendary space magic. I wonder when I will be returned to my new mother. I doubt the huts would spend much money on slaves, or to be slaves. Not unless it can make a lot of money. Born on an unknown world, Shmai Skywalker and her parents were captured by pirates and forced into slavery when she was just a young girl. She lived a difficult life as a slave, and was taken from star system to star system in the servitude of several masters, as the pirates were uninterested in having an extra mouth to feed, unless she could provide an essential service to them. Before she was bought by the huts, Skywalker was once sold in a market like the Zijarian slave market. Shmai lived with other families in communal quarters during her time as a slave of the some random slavers that had taken her from her family. One day she had discovered miraculously she had gotten pregnant. Despite the circumstance of the pregnancy, she not question it, not before or after the recent birthing of her child she named Anakin. Her beautiful child, that she had come to love her unconditionally mere moments after his birth. A true mystery, conundrum and difficult to explain if her masters cared enough to ask questions related to how she became pregnant. No, as far as they are concerned, her newborn child is just another slave to be used, sold or otherwise disposed of if deemed useless. Despite being aware of their position, there are even worse positions one in her station could be in. There are also even worse things waiting outside the protection of the huts. The horrors of space, whether that be other sentient and sapient life forms that take many forms or others of her own species. Besides the horrors of intelligent beings, there are other monsters that have no fear with desires and goals unknown to most factions throughout the galaxy. Enough of these depressing thoughts. I have to keep checking when the medical droids will release Ani to me. 
Despite the cruelties that could be experienced as a slave, there are at least basic medical checks to make sure slaves are healthy. Sadly the reason for checkups of this sort are not for the right reasons. Slaves, when it comes to the sale of said slaves can increase the price and sale of a slave, and people definitely love having more money. Luckily even as a slave, she does not have much work to do. This is thanks in part to the current slavers having more than enough slaves, and being competent enough to see the value and use of advanced technology, using droids to complete most menial tasks, instead of fleshly beings that tire. Shmai also has had to take some time to recover herself from a lengthy and arduous process of giving birth. Unfortunately she lacks the necessary power in her position to be able to know what is happening to her child, and can only wait. I can't wait to go back home. Alone in her thoughts until the sound of a door sliding opening and the mechanical sound and heavy footsteps of a medical droid enters her room. Excuse me. When will I be able to leave with my child? Soon. Says the droid in a calming synthesized electronic voice. While his mother is busy recovering, the newborn Anakin is practicing the force through meditation, trying to connect, sense and interact with the mysterious form of energy that has a deep to connection to all living things. Truly hoping to become powerful, for he knows his future or the original future of the alternate Anakin, he wishes to start his training as early as possible. From all the information he knows from his last life, he would have to find a way to not forget his foreknowledge, as it would be key to making sure he doesn't die. Create some way to protect himself, his mind, his body and his soul, because he knows of the powers those who are force-sensitive can have. He would also have to look into other things, to build himself up. Physically there is not much he could do, but that could be left to his future self right now he needs to find or create ways to make things easier for the future. Coruscant. Commonly known as the capital of the galaxy since ancient times dating back to the old Galactic Republic. The planet is an ecumenopolis. A city-covered planet, collectively known as Imperial City in the system named after itself, Coruscant, of the Core Worlds. Though debated by historians, it was generally believed that Coruscant was the original homeworld of humanity. Noted for its cosmopolitan culture and towering skyscrapers, Coruscant's population consisted of trillions of citizens, hailing from a vast array of both humanoid and alien species. In addition, Coruscant's strategic location at the end of several major trade routes enabled it to grow in power and influence, causing the city planet to surpass its early rivals and become the hub of galactic culture, education, finance, fine arts, politics and technology. It was the location of several major landmarks, including the Jedi Temple, Monument Pl The Jedi Grand Temple, also known as the Jedi Temple, was the home of the Jedi Order, an order of Force-sensitive peacekeepers, united in their adherence to the Jedi Code and the light side of the Force. In addition to its role as the central hub of all Jedi activities throughout the galaxy, the temple functioned as a monastery for Jedi Knights and Jedi Masters, as well as a school for the training of Padawans and Initiates. Within the temple the current Jedi High Council of Masters have come together because of a recent momentous event that has rippled in the Force, communicating to them that something of great importance has happened. Among this council were the Jedi Masters, Yoda, Mace Windu, Yaddle, Oppo Rancisis, Yarl Poof, Mika Jiyat, Sifo Dias, Even Peel, Eeth Koth, Adi Gallia, and Plo Koon. The attending members consisted of as many members that could be physically present, while there are some seats that remained empty, and a few displays created and projecting a hologram, because of some GD Master's absence. The backdrop provided by the high skylights and clear window views show technological lights illuminating the night, from the council's tower that looks down upon the beautiful Ecumenopolis below. A stark contrast is the mysterious atmosphere and tension being built up and shown through the usually calm but cold emotionless faces of the GD High Council. Small frowns, cresses within facial features whether a species with facial features to express it, the atmosphere itself sets the tone of discussion. Whispers and words are exchanged in hushed tones as everyone waits for the last of the council members to arrive for the meeting. Once everyone is present, GD Grandmaster Yoda speaks first. Green, small in stature with pointed elongated ears and a small walking stick. Despite his stature he is revered for his wisdom and power. Able to attend this meeting I thank you. Come to my attention something has. For others as well it seems. This meeting has been called to discuss what most if not all of us has has very recently experienced. GD Master Mace Windu took over. A ripple within the force. Affect all whom is most sensitive. Strong in the force it is. Responded Yoda. Plo Koon asks the questions that have been in everyone's mind. Where did it originate from? From my observations and meditation sessions, I have not been able to narrow down the location to a rough estimation. Let alone its precise coordinates. Has anyone had any other luck? Mace Windu poses towards the rest of the room. The less talkative of the current council speaks, and looks like a female version of Yoda, that is GD Master Yaddle, prominent in her precognitive and perceptions into the future. A disturbance. It is disbalanced a force, but it does not lean to either side in the balance. I cannot see into the possible future of this virgins. A few weeks had passed by as Anakin got adjusted to his new situation. His body was developing some hair, small tufts of a blonde shade, and he had seen the color of his eyes, blue. Within the first few days of his rebirth, he was confused but slowly started to become excited at the prospects of the universe he finds himself in. 
Not only has he been reborn as the character with supposedly the best potential in using the force, thankfully he had also brought with him the best gift possible from his past life. Knowledge. Knowledge of the future, techniques based of the force that I may be able to recreate through experimentation and the creation of possible new abilities. What I have been focusing on is force abilities or powers related to the mind. Why? Because it is relevant and important that I am able to hide myself, my memories, emotions and thoughts from others. Especially other trained force-sensitive individuals. From what he understood, he should be able to do many miraculous things that he would not have been able to in his previous world, simply because he has access to the force. He noticed that he had already been developing psychic powers where he was starting to feel the emotions of those around him. Starting to see the thoughts of others. Control of these abilities is what he is trying to achieve, he has an understanding of what powers he could practice, but doesn't have a place to start, other than reading another being's thoughts and emotions. He should be able to, once he has control of this aspect of abilities start to experiment, and maybe he would be lucky enough to find other abilities. Ani. Shmai Skywalker, his new mother could as she entered the room. After the test were done by the medical droids he had been released to his mother to take care of him. Picking him up, Shmai holds him in her arms. My sweet boy, are you hungry? She had taken a habit of talking to him as much as she could, just like any parent should help develop the minds of their children. Not that she knows this factor considering her life, but it was progress nonetheless. This would help him gather information on how to speak the basic language, not that he would need it considering the existence of telepathy. But knowing a spoken language itself will close the gap of communication. Mayani. Shmai starts to sob quietly holding onto Anakin still trying to grasp the situation that had landed her in this position. Anakin seeing this starts to think to himself. Many times I have seen her like this, and she tries to hide it, so well after a minute she manages to gain composure and goes back to talking to him. Discovering many things about his new abilities, Anakin had decided that he does not want to live the life of a slave. He does not want to just be another pawn in the great scheme of things that the force dictates. It connects and measures. He wants to be the master of his own destiny, to be totally free, and to do this he needed a plan, a plan of escape and the power to pull off the act. Anakin's mother took him with her to sleep next to her within her bedroom. Sleep now, Ani. It is late. She tries to rock him to sleep, and he fakes it. After a short while, she had put him into his cot beside her bed, and she had drifted off into the dreamscape herself. In the end it all depends on someone's power. Without the strength to protect oneself, you would not have freedom. At least not true freedom in the sense you would be unrestricted in what you do, and most desires could be fulfilled. Of course freedom does not mean you would have everything in the world, but it is a start. Very, very basic meditation is what Anakin had been practicing to see if he could connect with the Force on a deeper level, giving him any insights into what he could do. Considering his precognitive abilities have also started to develop, meaning he has some sort of extrasensory perception, allowing him to visualize the action someone would take in the next moment. But that is not what he wants, or needs. He needs an ability that would help him start his revolution, his escape from slavery, and he has an idea of what that may be. He may not be able to control those around him, his mother, the other slaves or even their current owner, simply because he doesn't have the expertise on how to do so. But what he has is some creativity, raw power, and with some luck, he may be able to do something. At the top of his to-do list. Control some droids. That is right, he has hypothesized and consulted with the force itself to see if it would react to his questions, foremost being. Can I recreate the force technique Meku Deru? Basically being the child of the force itself, it would stand to reason it may become biased when it has to do with anything concerning him. He felt a surge, a response to his question. What he felt was confirmation that he would be able to do so. So he tried, he knows that the original had talents in regards to technology. It was clearly seen how he was able to construct and reconstruct many, various bits and pieces, and turn it into a working droid. At least it is what the original did. Here he himself wants to do more than that. Mekuderu was a dark side force power that bestowed an intuitive understanding of mechanical systems upon the user. Invented by a Sith, and aligned with the dark side, Anakin could not think of a greater ability to help him now. Considering he lives on a ship, surrounded by others like himself and his mother, but the ship has droids, droids with which he can use. In fact the ship itself could be controlled. But first I need to develop this ability. Given that Anakin had already been starting to gain some level of understanding about how technology works here as he has been paying close attention, he had also noticed his rapid growth. So fast did his understanding increase by leaps and bounds, despite only being newly reincarnated, it had barely been a month, at least from his count. The technique allowed its practitioners to exert their influence over inanimate and robotic constructs. Through Mekuderu, mechanical structures could be bound to the will of the user and imbued with the power of the force itself. And his first test experiment would be when he traveled into the common area that the slaves were allowed to go into. Droids would be patrolling and keeping an eye out for any trouble, luckily he was but a baby. Albeit a weird one if looked at, but nonetheless a helpless child that would be unable to do anything, so he would be overlooked for doing anything strange. With one droid, it would confirm his ability, his power, and would be the start of his rise. Sheev Palpatine, alternatively known as, Darth Sidious. 
Born 42 years prior on the planet Naboo to the aristocratic house Palpatine, Palpatine discovered the Sith at a young age as a collector of dark side artifacts. When he was just 17 years of age, he met Hago Damask, a Muun businessman who was in reality the Sith Lord Darth Plagueis. Under Plagueis manipulation, Palpatine killed his father and pledged himself to his new master's dark side teachings as Darth Sidious. Living a double life for many years, serving an untarnished career as Naboo's ambassador in the Galactic Senate, while learning from his master and training a young Zabrak who would later become to be known as the Sith assassin Darth Maul. His master Plagueis along with himself were both exceptionally skilled and powerful in the Force, and were able to conceal their identities from the Jedi for decades. Currently Darth Sidious has been planning to overtake in accordance with Bane's rule of two, murder Darth Plagueis, and usurp the role of Sith Master. As Plagueis more and more obsessed and privately continues his search for the key to eternal life, Sidious manipulates galactic politics, which would culminate in his plan to reform the Galactic Republic into an empire, with himself as the Supreme Emperor. Unwittingly, an experiment done by his master Darth Plagueis had become responsible for the procreation of Anakin Skywalker, the Chosen One. This was the result of Plagueis' insatiable and obsessive drive for eternal life. Sidious and his master, no doubt had felt the strong presence that warped and sent out a message to most highly trained force-sensitive individuals or those with great potential through the force. Much like how the High GD Council had convened a meeting to discuss the ripple, so too did Sidious and his master convene and try to locate this presence. Unfortunately it had been a few weeks since the last a presence was felt and delving deep into the dark side of the force was not helping them locate this disturbance. His master had pointed out to him and given a mission to locate the source of this disturbance, and he in turn sent out his own trained assassins to locate the source. He has also been keeping an eye on the GD in case they had something to do with this ripple, but they are just as confused as he and his master is. Luckily his punishment for his continued failure was put off because of his master's drive for eternal youth. The same unfortunately could not be said for his favorite trained Sith assassin, Darth Maul. Sidious is a cruel master. The desire to find the source lessened, but the unease of not knowing something that could interfere with his plans definitely unsettled him. More time had inevitably passed, and the pulse through the force was pushed to the back of his mind, for he had a galactic republic to manipulate. His desire to become the emperor and create and reform the republic into the empire he would lord over, was at the top of his goals. Tatooine. The desolate desert sands of Tatooine howl, and the cold arid air of the planet causes freezing temperatures, as half of the planet cools because of the setting of the suns. The three moons, Gumrasan, Gurmesa and Chanini, slowly orbit and illuminate the starry night sky, leaving no room for darker shadows. Within the de facto capital, Mos Espa, was the muffled sounds of activity echoing from every building in the main district. In contrast was in the slave distract where slaves were placed was entirely quiet. A haven for smugglers and criminal activity. Every so often one could spot the disembodied brains of those who belonged to the bomber order floating in jars that hung below their spider-like droid bodies. At night when most deals made through the black market created on the planet of Tatooine was taking place. Most wealth eventually found its way into the city of Mos Espa, with most of it procured from gambling and off-world trade, especially through the lucrative black market. The influx of commercial ventures fueled Mos Espa's growth, eventually securing its regional importance as a hub of economic and financial activity. Most of the primary economic exported goods traded out of Tatooine was delirium oil, silicax oxalate, and of course slaves. What was imported was various technology, consumables because of the planetary conditions and water. With high tariffs imposed by the huts, some believed themselves able to escape paying them by doing business in the planet's de facto capital, however often found themselves scammed and broke if not through gambling, through simple bad luck. Within a building, where many a noise was being produced, where the more economically wealthy of patrons come to gamble away their credits or other own things including slaves. At a table a game was taking place by four individuals of very distinct alien features, and one that is of human origins. One of the alien individuals was a Tadarian, a sentient winged species capable of flight. Male features, blue skin color, orange eyes. A diminutive small height of 1.37 meters, webbed duck-like feet, three fingers and toes, his face was shaped in a weird way with facial hair, and a hooked long snout resembling a trunk and crooked teeth and facial tusks. His looks not too dissimilar from a hybridized overblown fly. A unique feature to note is that Tadarians were known to be strong-willed and resistant to mental manipulation with the Force. His name is Watto, no last name as Tadarians were only allowed to have a last name if they came from a nobler royal family. Most of his life was spent in the army of the Tadarian government as a soldier serving a monarchy. However, he left Tadaria after he suffered an injury and went to Tatooine, where he watched the native Jawas sell used goods and decided to start his own business. This resulted in him starting a junkyard, aptly named Watto's Junk Shop. Today is the day he would be winning some new slaves, or would have been but may very well be his last time he would see the light of day or the sands of Tatooine. Gambling was the betting of credits or possessions in wagers or games like Sabak, and had been a popular form of entertainment in the galaxy for millennia. Gambling was rampant on Tatooine, propagated by criminal activity and the developing culture overruled by the Huts. 
Gambling, in fact, proved quite influential in and throughout galactic history, and would continue to influence the years to come. One common game played on Tatooine between avid gamblers was Savak. Savak is a popular card game that was often played for high stakes. When played professionally, the game was overseen by a dealer, either organic, as in Coruscant's Outlander Club, where four armed Kyugfa dealers passed out the cards and took up money for the house, or mechanical, as in other locales, where automated Savak dealer droids oversaw proceedings. The Rin claimed to have invented the Sabic deck and cards as a means of fortune telling. The game of Sabic used a deck of 76 cards featuring 60 numbered cards divided into 4 suits and 2 copies of 8 special cards. Each player is dealt 2 cards, sometimes 5, depending on the set of rules in play at the table, which make up their hand. There are 4 phases within each hand. Betting, calling, shifting and drawing. Within the current setting 4 players and an automated dealer droid surrounds a table. A human, a Tadarian, a Sinatine and a Hut is currently engaged in a game of Sabic. Only two out of this group is left to play out the current match, and the biddings is at a high price. If one were to look closely, you would be able to identify the hut as Gardala the Elder. Through an intermediary, Gardala the Elder is using to make a gamble. This gamble includes two of her slaves, and if she were to lose, she would have to transfer the ownership of her slaves. These two would be identified as Shmai Skywalker and her young toddler three years of age, Anakin Skywalker. Spoken through the Hittese language, Titaki Batmalia. Chuba. Atima Yuba Wan Ma, Minky Joes. No bargain. Time to bet. Hey you. This time you will pay, little fly. No bargain. Speaks the gargantuan in size hut. The translator assistant speaks basic galactic so those at the table might understand. My mistress said, it is time to bet. You Tadarian will pay and there will be no bargaining. The translator omits some details and changes some words to better convey and hide some insults. Che dot stupid fat huts and their even fatter ego. Thinks the Tadarian on the inside, but further expresses his utmost desire to please the female crime lord. Yes, yes, thank you. If only I could be as great as you. The other players can obviously tell what the Tadarian is trying to do, garner favor, and it seems to work a little. Grancha, Minky Joes. Boz Bshada. Very good, little fly. Let's move on. My mistress says, very good, and to continue with the game. The slave translator, translates. Obviously omitting certain details again. So, the last high intensity match begins, to decide whether Watto will finally get some slaves for himself, or will Gardala the Elder win back the losses incurred. As the planet slowly rotates and continues its 34 hour, 17 hour to 17 hour day night cycle. Time slowly passes by, as in the illumination from the moons of the night, one building in particular is louder than most. Inside the intense game taking place between Gardala the Elder and Watto, the new in town junk dealer. So far the game between the two had not progressed very far, leeway was made on Gardala's side, but Watto had something up his sleeve. The hut's deep laughter rings out across the gambler's den. Hoo 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 hoo. Atima dolpi kuna da nu, wanya bananabu ki nu, shada. This time I am going to win, and you'll never win, little fly. Says the hut crime lord in an arrogant tone. The translator of course keeps the translation cordial. The mistress says, I am going to win and you will not. Adding his own two cents, the translator also adds, to put it simply. With a straight poker face, Watto does not give away his inner thoughts, while the audience is also quiet in fear of potentially incurring the wrath of an infamous hut crime lord. The crowd in anticipation of the end game results, draws silence. Game set, the winner is Watto. The automated dealer droid announces as the crowd starts to disperse for two reasons, not wanting to be around an angry hut crime lord, and because the excitement of the game is now over. Choi, what? Outraged that she has lost, she lets out a few curses in her native language. Heh. <laughs> Watto does a small twirl in the air flapping his tiny fly-like wings, like a princess, while quietly mumbling to himself in a drunken stupor. Gardala the Elder in a huff, briskly starts to leave the casino, but not before giving an important piece of documentation over to her Slave assistant translator. Gardala speaks briefly of the fly-like alien, Boomalia Tutuna, and Bawa Pulai bed cheat me kimi shags. The bed is done, and you have managed to cheat me of my slaves. After raging a bit, she then further elaborating on her instructions, speaks to her slave translator, Chalya Boop Shada Buchuan Muliaki, and Bushags Nubakowin, Ro Baska. Give the little fly the documentation and the slave's controller, then let's go. The translator doesn't even bother translating before throwing the documentation and placing the slave controller on the casino's table, before promptly following his mistress. Watto slowly comes down from his state of elation. Not only has he won a generous amount of credits, but has also now been able to get his very own slaves. Human slaves, but slaves nonetheless enabling to probably take some of his workload off. What he doesn't know is not only will his new slaves free themselves, but even if he did, he would come to that the slaves would be useless to him in being able to help him. Where one would be but a toddler and the other a weak woman, especially of the human species, barely capable in manual labor and of minimal education. Tatooine. 
It had been three years since his rebirth, Anakin and Shmai were sold to the hot Gargula Basati on the desert planet of Tatooine, and the two were brought to the planet by a freighter, though they were not permitted to know their destination, and the ship's single refresher backed up during the flight, making the crowded ship's passengers extremely uncomfortable. During the flight, he had premonitions of Pottersing, and he saw a vision of himself as an older man, racing across the flats of Tatooine. Strangely enough, I have been receiving more than just dreams of Pottersing. Awoken from his dream by his mother, who carried him out of the ship when they landed, they were lined up before Gardulla and her aides. What ugly species, at least ugly to my normal human sensibilities. Anakin was correct in saying that the huts did not look too appealing to the eye, especially to the people who did not have attraction to them. More time passed and Anakin had grown accustomed to living here on Tatooine. While he was a slave of Gardulla, he became friends with fellow slaves Kitster Chanchani Banai and Polakwatexa, a human and Dwilek. Though the three were eventually sold to other masters, they remained friends, as they all lived in Mos Espa. Anakin had decided to stick to the plot for now, as it would be easier to escape from slavery if it was Watto and not the Huts. Several months after his arrival on Tatooine, while repairing a evaporator outside Gardulla's residence, Anakin decided to take the initiative and modify the device. His handiwork was observed by Watto, a Tadarian junk dealer who frequently gambled with Gardulla on Potterses or on gambling games within the local area. Impressed, the Tadarian gambled for custody of the Skywalkers and won, becoming the pair's owners two days later. Only that Watto will be in for some pain later on. Anakin had enough time to secretly steal some droids away from his previous slave owners, then when being moved over to Gardulla, he also stole some from her as well. Carefully but stealthily he had hid the droids here on the planet Tatooine after arrival. Meku Deru sure was a piece of work, he had to give it that, and he wasn't too surprised that he was able to learn it so quickly given the original's talent. But now that he is three he had developed along to be able enough to use a weapon, not that he would need it, considering his droids would become weapons, but that doesn't mean he would not train himself to use one. The top of the line weapon in mind was a gun, with some assistance through the force, it would be made possible to properly hold and aim correctly at where he would need to shot. For now though, that would be left to later. He has a flight to deal with now. Tatooine. Watto slowly made his way out of the casino, with dulled senses, stumbling around up and down with his winnings. Despite his drunken stupor, Watto is clearly still aware of his surroundings, keeping a clear lookout for potential problems on his way out of the casino. Sense is still dulled, but not to the point he is unaware thankfully in part to his training and experience as a soldier of his home planet, the shifty eyes of smugglers and other criminals eyeing him up and down, are noted at the back of his mind. TCH. I should have brought some standard protection. What was I thinking? While the planet is still considered a part of its night cycle, and as the atmosphere begins to heat up as dawn rapidly approaches, the night is receding, and the noise of the day is becoming more prominent. At the entrance and exit of the casino, the Tadarian Watto shiftily exits the casino while trying to be on high alert. Unfortunately, his capacity to think a few steps ahead into the future and then get drunk has limited his chances of escaping the casino unharmed, at the least, and at worst robbed completely and possibly dead. Fortunately, depending on one's perspective, none of these events will happen by any of the criminals or smugglers that was watching him, partly because of Gardulla, but mainly because of what is about to happen next. Continuing on his way down the sparsely populated streets with negligible activity, he appears at the front of his shop. As the double sons of Tatooine rise, on the outside of his junkyard nothing has seemingly changed, but within holds a surprise. Slowly turning the keys to the entrance and opening the doors, Watto lets out a grunt of pain before being able to register what had happened and promptly falls flat on the floor of his establishment. Knocked unconscious by a tozer of some kind, a toddler with blonde hair and blue eyes steps out of the shadows. Well that was easier than I thought it was gonna be. The unidentified toddler remarks in a high-pitched voice. Various other beings make themselves known. Droids built of nature to be combative, non-lethal blasters at the ready to shot at the downed veteran Tadarian soldier. My mother certainly wouldn't like me doing these kinds of things. A droid steps up and reports the situation. Master, we have secured the premises. Vocalize the combat droid currently in front of the child. Good. Search the Tadarian, then let me see what he has, and I would also like the rest to help secure the shop itself. After searching the Tadarian place his belongings on the counter, then throw him into one of the prison ships. Roger roger. Meku Deru sure works wonders, and finally I do not have to worry about the implant detonating and instantly killing me or my mother. Despite making sure to use Meku Deru on the implant to take control of it, I finally have freedom. This child, no more than three years of age is none other than Anakin Skywalker. Around him was pits and pieces that most would consider junk, a counter and other mechanic parts. The current state of Watto's junkyard business is not that good, average at best, but that's what you get for trying to start a business in a system owned by the Huts, also a planet that is immersed in slavery, criminal activity galore and much more. Poor decision making on his part, but it is exactly this junkyard which would fuel and fund the beginnings of his own faction of sorts. 
First things first, get Watto to transfer everything he owns under his name to my mother's name, because it would be weird for a toddler to have access to a business, wealth, and be able to control the money and junkyard. It is time to get this implant out of me, then out of my mother. Master, the junkyard currently does not have many parts to construct more droids. Approaches a droid. Okay, no problem. For now I need a few medical droids to start the operation I have been planning. Also escort my mother once she awakens to the shop. I wish to surprise her. Woken up by the sound of mechanical parts entering her home, Shmai Skywalker is confused and slightly concerned about the noise. Getting up from her bedroom, she swiftly approaches the door to Anakin's room to make sure he is okay. Before she could enter Anakin's room from the front door, the sound of multiple knocks was heard tapping against a door is heard. Metallic in texture, against a stony material surface. I will check on Anakin first, then see what is going on. Thought the concerned and overly protective mother. Opening the door, she is surprised and frightened at the same time, at the absence of her little Ani. Panicking a bit, the guest at the door starts to try lightly knock on the door very patiently, despite this it only increases the panic Shmai is feeling at the moment, with many thoughts going through her mind. In spite of the panic, her facial expression does nothing to show her internal feelings, a trait learned to help her survive her indentured slavery. Rapidly approaching the main living room of the sparse tight living quarters which show the living conditions a slave has, she hesitates to open the door. No I am sure it is fine. It might not even have to do with anything about Ani. In a semi-delirious state because of protective motherly emotions reacting to the situation, she opens the front door and is surprised but the droid in front of her. Mistress, I have been ordered by Master Anakin to come get and then escort you to your destination. Vocalized the droid. Am Master Anakin? Shmai asks in surprise. Affirmative, repeating orders, Master Anakin wants you to be escorted to your destination. Repeating itself. In disbelief, but in a much calmer state than before Shmai questions the droid. My Ani ask you to escort me? Where is he? Is he safe, okay? He is unhurt, right? A flurry of questions was directed at the droid. Affirmative, the master is okay. I was only told to bring you, no other directives was given. Once again repeating its orders the droid replies. Oh okay in a quieter tone, she finishes. Deciding to ask questions later and only thinking of her child and his whereabouts, Shmai follows the droid to her destined destination with no hesitation, not thinking if this were a trap because of the value placed on slaves and partially because of the desire to see her child safe and sound. Right. Take me to Anakin. While the droid is escorting his mother, little Anakin has decided the shop is in need of some interior redecoration and redesign, at the same time simultaneously taking control of and upgrading the security measures within the shop. The shop will extensively also go through a rebranding, so instead of a junkyard it would be turned into a proper business venture. Mainstay products will include a variety on droids, weaponry, armory and parts and upgraded parts needed for various spacecrafts currently in circulation, slowly becoming an intergalactic enterprise, but that's for the future. Right now the transfer of ownership rights is being processed, then right after that once his mother arrives and he surprises her with newfound freedom, he can vacate the bomb implant from within his head, and from within his mother's as well. Taking stock and going over current inventory was easy, made much easier with the help of the force technique Meku Deru, easily knowing everything stored within the computerized systems. Spreading out his senses through the force he is quickly able to determine surroundings completely, and then gets to work in using telekinesis to move and clean the surrounding area. While he does some menial labor being lazy and using the force, lazy because of his current physical capabilities due to age, the droids had successfully gone around the compound and was able to collect anything of interest. From leftover relics and memorabilia that most definitely originated from Watto's days as a soldier and various other blasters of various types, particularly modified for the form of a Tadarian. Other droids start search even more from within the junkyard's compound and invade Watto's living space and various quarters. By the time everything is packed away neatly and separated into piles from what is valuable and what is trash and should be scraped for parts, enough time has passed for Anakin to leave his state of meditation and his mother to arrive. Ani? Are you in there? The voice of a woman comes from outside to store entrance. Mother, I am inside. Anakin replies. I must not act too much like an adult, otherwise it would seem weird, it is safe to show advanced intelligence and great innate talent for basically everything, but I should not overexpose myself. Even towards my own mother. Come inside mother, I will explain everything. Okay Ani. The mother of Anakin Skywalker, otherwise known as Shmai Skywalker, is a woman in her mid-twenties in age, with dark brown hair, dark brown eyes and lightly tanned skin, distinctly different from the coloring of her child Anakin. Shmai Skywalker is a peaceful, selfless and kind person. To put emphasis on the point that she is as peaceful, selfless and kind is the line, the biggest problem in this universe is that no one helps each other. Certainly that's true with how cruel the galaxy and the people within could be. She very much loves her son Anakin, and is willing to sacrifice herself in order to let Anakin have the possibility of a better life. 
During her time under Gardala, Shmai still held out hope that she would eventually be free, but she eventually accepted her lot in life and had joy in raising her child with positive relationship with Anakin, cherishing their modest life in the slave quarters row. Her hope to escape and be free of her status as a slave was reignited with the birth of Anakin, but three years had passed and there is not much if anything at all that could be done. Living in the communal quarters during their time as slaves of the female hut crime lord Gardala Basadi the elder did not serve to embolden her. Ani? Are you okay, unharmed and safe? You didn't get into any trouble did you? Shmai questioned her son in a tone slightly reprimanding and concerned. I am fine. I have a surprise for you that's all. I just had my droid bring you over so I could share the really good, no great and exiting news. Of course Anakin reassures his mother, but further goes in to convince her to listen to what he wants to say, putting some emphasis on its importance. What's it Ani? Obviously relieved that her child is safe, but at the same time curious at the excitement evident in her baby's voice she gets him to continue. We are free. Anakin states. Free? Freedom. Free from being slaves, we can live a life where we no longer are shackled, enslaved and forced to do things for entertainment of our owners. We are not owned anymore. What are you saying Ani it's okay, we can go back to the slave quarters. In a defeated tone not realizing the situation, she tries to convince him into leaving, just so happens she also conveniently forgets the events leading up to her being here. Looks like she needs proof. Let me get that newly created documentation and show it to her on the digital device here, so she can see we have been released from slavery. Look here mother. This is the proof. Hesitantly approaching the device, she slowly goes over the text, barely being able to read basic galactic, due to being poorly if at all educated, but she is able to make out the important parts. This this is I can't believe. I am, no. We are free, my child and myself, free. No more did she have to dream and have a deep longing for freedom. Becoming sentimental and overly emotional and slightly fatigued from the entire morning's proceedings was no doubt something that has caught her off guard. All of a sudden she had been granted freedom, and all she wanted to do was take a seat and process the emotions and possibility of such an even to take place. After a few minutes, Shmai comes out of her stupor and question her son. How? Tatooine. Within a ship at an undisclosed location, a Tadarian figure slowly awakens within its prison cell. Watto is confused, has a pounding and headache, and overall feels like he has been through war all over again. He feels cold, or at least he is making contact with something that's cold, he also feels constricted where most of his movement and mobility is weakened, if not completely come to a halt. Trying to get a sense of his surroundings he slowly tries to sit up, and as he does so he further notices difficulty in trying to move any of his limbs. Thankfully his vision and ability to hear has not been impaired so he could regather and gain an understanding of his current predicament. What has been impaired however, is his ability to create sound. The ability to speak. Looking around himself, Watto is met with four walls of bland metallic black and grey coloring, and a one-way door reinforced steel plated walls, with a small dual reinforced glass window at the top of the door. Viewing himself, he sees he has been captured or kidnapped by someone unknown to him and subsequently imprisoned, and going by the, the technology used to trap him, the person should be of some kind of criminal of low wealth. Obviously there aren't that many people on Tatooine that wouldn't be considered a criminal or slave of some kind, but at least knowing of a person's amount of wealth could help him discern if he is going to be enslaved, killed, harvested of organs or experimented on helps him. The master will be arriving soon, continue to stay guard and make sure the prisoner is secure. Those are your directives. Vocalize the synthesized robotic voice of a droid from outside his prison cell. Affirmative. Another responds before the tapping of metal could be heard resounding and getting smaller, before being unable to hear anything else. The master? That doesn't sound ominous at all, but tells me despite the conditions I have been kept in, the person who has imprisoned me has some help from droids. Hopefully I could negotiate my way out of this, offer something up to my captor. Play on their greed, it does seem like they need it. Deciding to be productive about his situation, Watto tries to find any flaw within the entrapment he is within, and the items used to restrict his mobility. Unfortunately nothing that could be immediately done to help his situation, none of his experience as a soldier would help him here, where his training only taught how to be capable in a gunfight, and even then, he was not the good at it. Time passes by, seconds turn into minutes and minutes turn into hours, and the outside every so often some noise would happen to indicate the shift in the positioning of the droid outside, time to time moving around seemingly doing something. Eventually a slightly larger commotion is taking place outside his cell, and from the sound it could either be his captor or savior. At this point he would take either, with preference of a savior, but he doubts anyone would willingly risk their life for him, and hopefully if it was a savior, it was not an enemy coming after him for some of his debt from his home planet. When thinking about it, my captor could be a debt collector, or some law enforcer to bring me back to Tadaria. Muffled sound is heard from outside, a voice, but unlike those of the droids, it is clearly of a real person. Something's wrong though, the voice is a bit too high-pitched to be an adult, but I may just be hallucinating from lack of hydration and remnants of my hangover. Why, hello there. A few minutes before with Anakin.
trying to convince one's own mother of something seemingly impossible, keep her calm and explain to things that she would not have had to think about before is exhausting mentally. Emotionally as well. After a long, through and carefully edited explanation of events that led up to myself and Shmai, I had finally settled her emotions. After settling everything and giving the droids their directives and orders about what and what not to do, then to further help Shmai in learning how to in general operate or command the droids. In the future I myself do not plan on running the business, and would hopefully be able to fully automate it through the use of various robots and artificial intelligence, that has been through a thorough and extensive conditioning process, both through Mekuderu and advanced programming, to keep them loyal. For now the basic intelligence the current droid collection has is enough, especially if I create or redesign a few to be optimized in areas of economics, marketing, accounting, and much more. Briskly walking along the sandy dunes of Tatooine, the young toddler known as Anakin, comes across a well-hidden ship, while being escorted by a few combat droids armed at the ready for anything to go wrong. Can't be too careful with my own security. Approaching the lowered entrance bay two droids are alert and are standing at the ready. These droids stand at attention as their young master approaches. Report. Anakin commands. Master, the prisoner has been kept under the conditions you have wanted. The Tadarian is currently severely dehydrated and seems to be in a state of shock, and by monitoring his vital signs, nothing of significance has been found. One of two droids state. I will go in myself, the rest of you stay around and do whatever, guarding or something while I take care of some business. Anakin says in a playful tone. Entering the ship at the hangar bay, Anakin orders the droids to stay outside as he goes down the passageway to his captive. Upon entering the containment bay of this low-end ship stolen from some low-tier smugglers, the pitiful sight of a dying fly is brought into sight. Quite pitiful okay, maybe not. I do not care too much. The droid standing just outside the cell of Watto, moves aside swiftly already knowing what its master is here for. The door automatically opens as if the ship is alive, and shows the Tadarian in full form. Why, hello there. Exclaims Anakin in a playful tone befitting of his current age. Anakin approaches and rips the multiple strips of tape covering the entirety of Watto's mouth, allowing to finally breath a bit better, and having access to the ability to speak again. After taking a few mouthfuls of air, but clearly unable to let out a proper sentence yet, lets out a, wah? Barely able to get any words out, Watto is taken aback as what approaches him is not full-grown being, but a human child no more than a few years of age. This is where the fun begins. Anakin pulls off a rather creepy smile that is disconcerting towards Watto. Still confused and muddle-headed about the situation he is in Watto tries to demand for some answers, talking down to the child. Listen here kid, what is going on here, who has imprisoned me here and get me out of these bindings? Well that's no way to talk to your warden. Still being playful, Anakin antagonizes the fly. Shut up kid, I got no time for your games. Let me out, or at least get me some adult that's in charge here. Watto says in a much more heated tone. Getting a sense of Watto's emotions even though he should be protected, Anakin slowly starts to slowly unravel his thoughts through looking into his eyes. A few errant thoughts pass through Watto's mind, but most of his emotions of fear has dissipated at the sight of a child, helping to lower any mental guards put up. I thought it would be harder to enter his mind, considering Tadarians and other species that have the same trait, are able to remain unaffected by some force techniques related to the mind, like the GD's infamous mind trick. Interesting nonetheless, as this tells me I do not have to worry about not being able to enter the minds of others. It would still be a challenge to breach the minds on force-sensitive individuals, and would be much harder if they learn my force technique based off of reading another's memories. Another creation Anakin created for himself to make his life easier. Still going through the mind of Watto as most of his internal mind defenses have come down because of the combination of the pounding headache caused by the hangover, dehydration, the shock, confusion and emotional turmoil of his situation, made it all the much easier to dive into his memories. Doing this though will cause a large amount of damage, as he has not reached a proficient level yet in being able to view another's memories with harm. Thoroughly searching and extracting what is important to him like information and passcodes to various stashes and accounts filled with various amounts of different currency types, along with documentation. While this is happening, in real time only three seconds had passed displaying the incredible mental abilities Anakin has developed through practice. All that practice does pay off, 40 hours every day. Ling Ling would be proud. There are a few things in his memory displaying just how cowardly and disgusting this fly is, and it seems the galaxy, if not the universe at large, would do better without him. Technically he wouldn't have much impact overall on anything given his current state, and even previous before I have taken everything from him, unfortunately I need to get rid of all witnesses at my current state of being. Kid. Are you even hearing me, you no good brat. Useless. Watto grows impatient as Anakin only takes a few seconds until he is finished with doing what he wants. Watto's words come to a crawl as he says this, and starts to dribble at the same time due to the mental damage afflicted. My business here is done. I have no need for you anymore, you're luckier than most would be, partially because I have gotten everything I need, and I do not need you for experimentation anymore. What does that mean? Exasperated Watto asks. It means you are disposable. Anakin finishes and the droid just outside the cell steps in with the blaster at the ready. 
Wait, wait, wait. I can give you everything I have. Everything. Watto pleads in a last desperate attempt to live whilst in a state where his mind is slowly degrading. No need. Do it. Outside the ship the various droids are having small conversations among each other, waiting for their master to return and give directives, when from within the sound of a blaster is heard. The noise instantly silences the droids, and the stand ready Anna at attention as they know their master is done with his business. A minute later Anakin walks back outside exiting from the docking bay. Right. Now to move on with my life, and experience some freedom and put a lot of my plans into action. Moving in line with their master they depart while another droid from within, drags out the lifeless corpse of Watto to dispose of and set of in course for their next direction. You guys will go ahead of me and set up at the point of contact, and make sure not to cause much trouble. I need things to go peacefully. Wouldn't want to ruin my chances of gaining more power now. Affirmative master. The group of droids respond in unison, and in swift haste board the ship to depart for their location. The ship starts up, and with careful precision shots up into the skies above, while Anakin and the leftover droids move along the sandy dunes of Tatooine underneath the blazing twin suns. I know Ani said everything is alright and all, but I still worry for his safety. He is smart and I trust in his decisions, but something feels slightly off at the same time. Shmai Skywalker's thoughts scramble trying to come to terms with her new feelings. Why do I trust him so much? Anakin had used a bit of the mid-reading techniques he had grown accustomed to increase the level of trust Shmai feels towards him, but what can you do? A three-year-old child tells you he has grand ambitious plans and desires, while also at the same being your child. He wants to set off into the stars doing who knows what, but still expect her to be complicit and accepting of his choices. More than likely not. Thankfully his created force techniques, even though a scummy move against his mother, he needs or does not need her permission for what's to come next, and he most certainly will not pass up every opportunity he can get in a universe he currently resides in. The presence of space magic would have been more than enough to convince him. Never mind, I will just stop thinking on this subject anymore. I should have faith in the capabilities of my son, despite his age tattooing. The great thing about droids is the lack of necessities most living creatures need, like sleep, food, drink, morale, and other things used to keep an individual well-kept and happy with their employer. Droids, droids don't need any of that. The disadvantage though is the lack of flexibility the droids have when it comes to their programming. Their level of intelligence is lacking, but good enough to perform a few tasks that is pre-programmed into them, and they have some limited adaptability in those tasks given. Simple but efficient and highly cost-effective, especially when I can use Meku Deru and directly usurp control of them from any of their owners previous. It has been a few months since his own freedom had been gained, which now allows him to put more of his plans into action. To not be looked over by someone above had felt liberating. What happened to Watto was that he had died. He was to live a fate worse than death if he had lived simply because Anakin's created techniques could mentally hurt the person it was used on. Which was what had happened to Watto. His mental health would have deteriorated until brain death. So it was either a quick death after his usefulness was over or let him be tortured, and Anakin is not so sadistic to get pleasure out of the torture, especially since Watto didn't even have a chance to do anything to him or his mother. The junkyard business previously owned and developed by Watto has now come along nicely and reformed to better suit Anakin's tastes in style and economic value. A simple junk dealer-based business has become something a little more standardized, as in the products now being sold have started to vary from trash. Droids are currently not being sold or put up for any auction, simply because he needs every droid he could get his hands on, but what he has acquired and been selling is various stolen or acquired weaponry sold to the public. Most of the customers that come by are those of shady backgrounds, more than likely meaning they were criminals. No doubt suppling criminals with weapons can be seen as dangerous to the public, but he could not make much wealth at least not in the position he is in right now without taking those risks. Thankfully he has plans in this regard in particular and will within another month or two, be able to gain a connection to someone who is the CEO of a technology-based company. He has other plans to expand his business and make himself legitimate within the Republic in the future, but for now he can start to take over other minor businesses located on Tatooine. Build up some more wealth and prestige in the economical sense, then try automating his business so it does not heavily rely on his input all the time. This would help not only himself but also his mother in the future when it comes to management, because he plans to have her involved in some way. This would help give her purpose in life, and she could use the leftover wealth she has to help buy then free slaves. Of course this isn't a permanent solution or good one either way it would help her and others, and those whom are freed could technically become a part of the developing branches of the company. Anakin does not want to stop at being a simple international company, but wants to expand into the state of being these large traders become. He wants it to become galactic in scale, and what is known to reach levels as high as that was the Trade Federation, a corporate organization that is one of the wealthiest, and they gained most of their wealth by controlling interstellar shipping that passed through the Rim-based territories. That is the state he wants his own to reach. Too bad in the future it had dissolved and had come under the control of Palpatine for his newly formed galactic empire. Now I can't allow that, now can I? It would only be ever so gracious of me to take them under my willing command. 
Plans aside to overtake and fully control the Trade Federation, their operations and primary roles in interstellar trade and shipping as a conglomerate, what needs to be done to slowly dominate the economy of Tatooine is to specifically target what is neat. First when taking a look into the expanse of land and terrain in general on Tatooine, not much can be done to revitalize the planet. This is not taking into account the atmospheric conditions making the planet near unlivable, the modern day land is not in any condition to house a large population. This is why Anakin had set his eyes on Dathomir and its large amount of fertile lands, because despite its potential threats and dangers, there is much left to exploit and harvest or control on that planet. Thinking of Tatooine, what the planet could become there are only two natural resources, not including their slaves on this planet that is considered major exports. While the major imports that Tatooine is in frequent demand of was technology, consumables and water. I have already started the beginnings of creating a business based off of various technologies, even if for now it is only weaponry, into the future technology won't be of too much for the general population of Tatooine. The main industries Anakin will want to target is food and water production. Given how important water is to Tatooine, creating farms or technology that could produce more water on this barren planet would be profitable, if only in the future. In the beginning it would cost a lot of investment-based funding, time and effort, but in the end it should be worth it. The major exports of Tatooine, Delarium oil and silicax oxalate, were only found on Tatooine. Delarium oil as the name suggested was an oil, used in fueling most of anything, and given the untapped riches of Tatooine, a lot of it could still be found or extracted. While silicax oxalate was a mineral that could be found in various mining locations both old and new on the planet, and were generally only considered something of worth in terms of jewelry. A type of crystal, where its value is compared with other materials like diamonds, rupees and other materials. By taking over the various mines and bringing them under his control, Anakin could profit and help acquire more funding to reinvest into his developing business. This is easier said than done as the process is much more complicated than that because of the nature of the planet. The Huts are in control or more specifically Jabba whom is a Hut crime lord is in charge. The Huts were well known as galactic gangsters whose Grand Hut Council controlled the Hut clan crime syndicate. One famous Hut was the crime lord Jabba who ruled a massive criminal empire from his palace on Tatooine. The Huts were not only a clan-based criminal syndicate with massive criminal empires, but also a species. One way to start laying a stake or claiming the lands of Tatooine is by becoming the leader of the native sentient species, the Jawa and Tusken Raiders. It would not be all that hard to control them through both respect and fear, as they are very responsive to both violence, but also acts of mercy. It also doesn't hurt that fact that I could manipulate their emotions through his recently created technique, but that would only be there to reinforce absolute loyalty and make sure they would follow my law and order. We don't want to repeat the same event that originally happened to the original Anakin's mother. Dantuine. Dantuine was a pleasant world of grasslands, rivers and lakes. The planet was located in the Ryabalo sector of the Outer Rim, had an endpoint of Mito's Arrow, the other endpoint of which was in the Abtrexta sector, though Dantuine itself was still far removed from most galactic traffic. It hosted a small population spread amongst single-family settlements and small communities with large land holdings. Its sentient population consisted primarily of simple human farmers, though Dantuine was also home to the primitive Dantari race. What was truly important though was the person known as Naro Siener. Naro Siener is a not-so-common man of the human species, while at the same time just so happens to be the CEO of Sant Siener Technologies. Despite being the owner of one of the Corellian Engineering Corporation's primary competitors, Siener helped the corporation design the successful IT-1300 light freighter. He being the businessman that he was had come to the remote planet of Dantuine for some trade agreements. He had come on his top-of-the-line starship and had gone down to the planet briefly as they were just passing by, and he just had to the, the opportunity in trying to see if there was anything of value. Maybe, just maybe he could hit the jackpot in finding some valuable material of some kind, even if it would not help him in his business, he could always find ways to profit. He had been on the planet for a few days now, and he had not come across anything he would take advantage of, neither the locals or other passerbys could offer up anything more to him. There was a strange occurrence though that had led to him waiting a little longer before continuing on his way. Multiple combat droids escorting another more advanced droid that would be classified as the translator or communication-based prototype droid approached me. It had simply come up to him and proposed to him a partnership that would involve the benefits of upgraded droid production, where they would be smarter and have a higher degree of advanced artificial intelligence design. It further went on to explain its creator also wanted to talk to him about other things, as well as this proposal, believing they would generate huge income. It was suspicious, but at the same time the degree at which the messenger droid and the combative types around it were much better or attentive and seemed to process and learn better than other examples, despite the clearly lacking in quality parts. He suspected it may very well be a scam, a scam that was done very well, but only time would tell. While waiting even more for the arrival of this figurehead that Wooder has created some type of new technology, the droid with their signature markings addressed him in a formal greeting. Greeting CEO of Santh or otherwise known as Siener Technologies, Naro Siener. 
I have come again to inform you of some important information passed into me from my master. The droid currently spoke an intergalactic basic standard. Oh. I was expecting to meet him personally, does he not have the time of day? Sarcastically and a bit arrogantly, Naro perceives this as a potential scam. Negative. The master is not obstructed from meeting you, but has decided that the dealings between the parties are to kept anonymous. Heh. Is that so? Well, go on and tell me this important information. Untrusting, he still speaks in a sarcastic tone. The droid seemingly shrugs off the tone of Naro and fulfills its task. The master wants to inform you of an assassination attempt on the life of your son. Ha. Huh. Is that really the way you are going? A threat of some kind against my family? Really? I can assure you, this is no joke, and that the attempt on your child's life will be a failure because they have instead implanted a device on your Starliner. It was planted there by Zychar led by their prelate as a fanatic polytheistic religious order of the Zycharians. The droid tries to explain. I am sure you have heard of them, this organization has devoted itself to high precision manufacturing. To that end, they founded the Harichol Engineering Company. Further elaboration from the droid is given. Ridiculous. Why would they target Mimi, let alone my son? Obviously wound up, Naro questions in a demanding tone. From what the master has said this would be the second attempt on your son's life. Nine years ago, Wraith Senior, your son infiltrated the Zychar, stealing valuable information from them, while posing as a convert to the order. When he was exposed for what he truly was, the Zychar attempted to assassinate him. Why have I not heard of this then? Your child did not inform you of his escapades? The droid vocalized answering back with a question of its own. Stumped for a bit, rather believing this to be a farce, but before Naro could do anything else recordings were given and showed of his son's own deceit against the Zychar. The master said you would be more compliant to listening when given all the information. Standing there just outside his shuttle used to descend onto Dantuine, the man known as Naro Siener is speechless. Naro Siener's Starliner above Dantuine. Within the Starliner's docking bay area, a small ship had been let in for inspection before it would be parked properly. This ship let through was a sent by the Zychar, sent under the guise of another trade partner coming in to deliver some supplies and other relevant information. Really, the Zychar and its religious leader known as the Prelate, had wanted to claim their revenge against Wraith Siener, for they had failed at their first attempt. The Prelate had come to believe Wraith could be found on the same Starliner his father Naro was on. Why? Because who wouldn't try to protect their child, and what child would not go to their father for some help to avoid danger, especially when it concerns their lives? On the personal Starliner of Naro, the Prelate had sent some of their people to infiltrate and implant an explosive device to make sure Wraith would die. Infiltrating and stealing their technological secrets. Naro and his son Wraith was among the wealthy and secretive Sienar clan, which had a history of starship design stretching back thousands of years. Wraith ever since he was young was raised and had a wealthy but secretive upbringing, and when going into this teenage years attended the Rigovian Technical University, and the young man's mind quickly turned to engineering, developing an outlook that saw life as a series of engineering puzzles. Quick to learn and with an overriding desire for intellectual stimulation, Sienna grew restless within the upper-class confines of his family, seeking to distinguish himself and be unpredictable and innovative. In his teens, he struck off on his own to make his mark independently. Sienna took his own personal funds and created his own scouting firm. The youth took to the star lanes, mapping new hyperspace routes and probing the unknown regions to find habitable and exploitable worlds. Some of his discoveries, such as one uncharted black hole that he found, Sienner kept to himself, seeing a possible future advantage in such personal knowledge. Others, he shared and sold, turning a tidy profit and becoming independently wealthy by the age of 20. He had built a personal fortune without the aid of his family and untouchable by them. Wraith assumed a series of false identities and took work with competing firms, moving through the management of the Corellian Engineering Corporation, Bactoid Armor Workshop, Income Corporation, and even the Trade Federation. There, he gained first-hand experience undercover, without the distraction of his family name, and picked up various techniques from his competitors. Of course he later had a false identity created for his infiltration into the Zychar. With his corporate studies where some would say espionage concluded, Wraith returned to Sant Siener where his father, Naro created an internal workshop for Wraith to head, Siener Design Systems was to specialize in unique personally contracted work for the ultra-wealthy. And its clandestine advanced projects laboratory worked on experimental cutting-edge designs with a specialty in ion drive technology. The Zychar had rightly assumed and predicted the location of Wraith, aboard the family yacht with his father for a pleasure cruise. A few hours had passed, and Naro had returned to the Starliner visibly upset and slightly pale. This trip was meant to be a pleasurable cruise, but it had to be ruined when he had taken a trip down to that remote planet. No one wanted to question why he had become upset for they feared losing their jobs, so too did his close family members not to question it either, especially because this trip was meant to be enjoyed. Naro may become even more upset than he was and most did not want that to happen. He is a strict man, and this was one of the aspects that led to his son doing things behind his back, like espionage which would very soon get Naro himself and his son Wraith in trouble. Father welcome back, how was your small escapade down to that backwards planet? 
The young currently 22-year-old Wraith came up to his father dismissing his father's current emotional state. Despite Wraith's experience in espionage and genius intellect, he had made mistakes when it came to his infiltration of the Zychar. What Wraith did not know of was someone had managed to capture what he had done in perfect clarity through a recording device that had been planted into the Zychar Institute. The one to do this was the mysterious master of that droid whom had approached him that very day. Naro was not happy with his son, given that he had helped him be reintroduced into his company and had given him his very own department. At least he was capable enough to create new advancements in their primary role as a shipbuilding company. If his son had made mistakes though, he would cut under punishment from the clan, because their company was a subsidiary of the parent company Santh Corporation, headed by another family known as the Santh. If what that droid had said was correct and the evidence was fabricated, it could spell doom for his position within the company. His title is CEO gone. Naro's scowl increased the closer he drew to his son, and further became worse as the youth spoke to him with a harmless smile. What's with that look on your face father? Did something untoward you happen? Of course Wraith does not know why his father is upset, and who is specifically upset with. Shut up boy. You have gone and done something behind my back that I can't ignore. Naro was undecided about how to take the death threat. Was it serious or some sort of twisted sick joke? If it was true then he and his family and his subordinates as well helping him on his leisure trip are in danger. It is true he is a part of a wealthy and secretive clan that sometimes sees themselves above the public, but he has always had a soft spot. Hell he had even helped his competitors, the Corellian Engineering Corporation, and had helped the corporation design a successful IT-1300 light freighter. Unintentionally or not, he had helped them come up with something that may have benefited himself if he stole some of their design plans. Being the better man that he was he did not resort to that, but his child. His only son and done something he himself would never do despite the corporate world based off of wealthy higher-ups and leaders corruption most of the time stuff like this would happen. He did not agree with their methods. Is this how I had raised my son? Despite his inner worry he cared for his son, like any parent would, and he believed himself to have raised him correctly, but it seems he was wrong in that assumption. Seeing his son's young face and features he could see his wife within him, within his eyes. For the safety of his child he would do anything, and it seems that he has been caught with his pants down. Unsure with how to deal with the situation presented itself to him, he could only proceed with caution. Boy, get the attention of the crew and inform them of a possible implanted bomb placed on the Starliner. Naro orders his son. Bomb? Wraith questions. Yes there is possibly an explosive device somewhere on this ship. I want to evacuate not only myself and you, but if possible the crew as well, but that is unlikely to happen. So I want you to take the smaller ship and escape down onto the planet. Father, you can't be serious? A bomb with our level of security? Wraith being so sure of the security they have and safe in the knowledge that the Zychar assigned mercenaries would not be able to track him here, he does not worry about another assassination attempt. This is an order. Get onto a smaller ship and leave while I try to help out in the search for the explosive device. Naro near outright shouts at his son. In the event there is a device implanted here and I am unable to find it in time, I want you to know I that I love you. Now go. Naro continues after calming down. Wraith confused and slightly concerned at the tone of his father, decides to listen and escorts himself out the restroom area, with no one else listening or hearing what had gone on between the two. Now to figure out if what that droid's master said was true. I guess I will find out either way. What Naro does not know, is that the mercenaries have already boarded his ship, but have not planted the explosive device yet. The mercenaries that had successfully infiltrated Naro's Starliner, were now quietly trying to move around the various aqueducts and ventilations of the ship. They were a rather high-priced band, and because of this they have a high-quality level of skill. This particular commission that had come to them came at a very high profit, but just like everything else in the galaxy, it had also come at a high level of risk. No different from a gamble, and if they were successful they would become rich. A small thud was heard within the small and tight spaces. One of the mercenary members had accidentally made a sound. SHHHH, keep quiet, don't stuff this up for the rest of us, if you want to be caught go and do so, but do not test my patience. The commanding officer in the ranks quietly berated a member through the communication device. Yes sir, sorry, a short reply also spoken quietly was given. The initial start of the mission was going quite well, where the pressure and danger level was actually overestimated, but what would one expect when the crew of the Starliner were relaxed due to the nature of the crews was too leisurely. Of course there was still a certain level of security kept to make sure nothing that could cause problems for the owner or his son. Usually most problems of a lower level would never reach their level, because it would be deemed as incompetence, had they not be able to fix the problem themselves without someone higher up getting involved. Not many situations would occur for something like that to happen though. The mercenaries a few hours ago were having quite the time of their lives, and stimulated over the idea off of such a high-paying customer, caused their own level of skill to go down a bit. This wouldn't have been a problem if everything was going accordingly to plan, but very recently the security measures were increased. The personnel of the ship were frantic, and had begun a wide-scale search of everywhere, starting with the docking bay where their very own escape ship had been placed. 
This increased the difficulty of the mission at hand, where now their escape route had not been completely cut off, but had become heavily monitored. The personnel also in a panicky search, had also been bad to their cause as well. Various droids were also patrolling multiple areas of the ship, but most importantly the engines where it was the important and their intended target. If the explosive device they had brought on board was planted in the designated engine areas, an explosion large enough to destroy the ship would be produced. Checking in on his team and mapping out the path from himself and his crew, he had decided that they would need to leave this area soon, especially since there was activity indicating that the passageways they were hiding in may be checked. Briefly turning on his communicator he speaks, OK, we need to move and move quickly. Short and simple commands were given. Various replies were given. They quietly and skillfully made their way through the dark and claustrophobic spaces, winding themselves through the tunnels. Slowly but surely making themselves get to an area that had been checked already and cleared by the personnel of the ship. This was confirmed through using specialized technologies and programmed a virus to hack into the ship's database so that they could map out the ship originally. Now it is being used to redirect them to safer areas. We should be safe for now. What they didn't know was they were not as safe as they would assume, but for now they were in the clear. For now Dantuin. A small ship departs from the cruiser-type Starliner above Dantuin headed for the planet. Going at a fast pace, the ship hastily lands in an area covered and hidden away from the locals and anyone potentially looking for a landing ship. The ship was akin to an escape pod only meant to be used in emergencies, and within the ship contained a passenger of some importance. Wraith Senior, the young, intelligent and independently wealthy child and next in line to lead the shipbuilding corporation known as Santer Senior Technologies. Wraith Senior is a human male born on the planet and is his homeworld of Coruscant. He stood at 1.8 meters tall, black hair, blue eyes, and has a fair and pale skin complexion, and he is also quite being only 22 years of age. Born into a wealthy, long-standing core world's family, and grew up as a member of the core aristocracy, with all the expectations of luxury and culture that came attached to such a background. He was a highly competitive youth, but over time he began to concentrate his efforts only in those areas for which he knew he was suited, minimizing his chances of disappointment. He developed a highly inquisitive mind that quickly turned to engineering, he had a constant wish to innovate and fine-tune, and constantly thought up new designs. Wraith followed no moral code, instead approaching issues dispassionately, he considered excessive emotion a weakness. He considered all life's challenges engineering problems, and worked to solve them for his own benefit. His goal was power, the ability to do and build as he wished. Which is what most people desire, true freedom to do what one wants to their heart's desires, but his desire may very well corrupt him, and he worries as such. Worries that he would become complacent, lack the ability to change and adapt to anything, but his worries may just be excessive. Not tempted by physical luxuries such as food, drink, or sex, only those of the mind appealed to him. Wraith also approached friendship merely as another tool, he preferred friends he could manipulate and turn to his own advantage, rather than companions. In fact, he preferred his own company and spent much of his time alone with only droid systems around him. Wraith preferred a more elegant and aristocratic design philosophy in which ships were designed for maximum performance and beauty, pushing the envelope and delivering force with precision and finesse. He also preferred small, customized orders rather than mass-produced ships, and in his first decade with the company, he devoted his energies to that ideal and argued for it, complaining of what he perceived to be a coarsening of design ideals and, most importantly, lack of imagination. He was not entirely averse to mass production, however, but merely left that aspect of the business to others, as he innovated and produced custom work or more specifically, currently left that to his father. Often he drew inspiration from the mistakes of others, and would invest heavily in the failed schemes of competitors, particularly in projects that were unsuccessful due to simple reasons, so that he could fix any design flaws, and then use the failed projects for purposes of his own. Despite his nature of no morals with little care in the world, he knew that keeping one's subordinates happy was productive for his plans and future. Especially when it came to his line of work, where espionage was commonplace. He made sure his engineers were kept comfortable and happy and paid all his employees well, it was only the bureaucrats and accountants working for him that he disdained and did not pamper. While professional products created by him consisted mostly of spaceships, his personal engineering skills were versatile, and he designed many products, from droids and droid neutralizing systems to security systems to chairs, both for personal and corporate use. Overall he could be considered a somewhat normal person with an extraordinary background and set of skills that would be beneficial to any whom would employ him, but it would also be prudent to keep an eye out because of his disposition and history. The small vessel housing Wraith finally makes a landing on the remote planet of Dantuind in a sparse lush forested terrain below. It was currently the night cycle of the planet he was on, and Wraith could view the two moons with the setting sun as a backdrop. A terrestrial planet in the Ryabalo sector's Dantuine system of the northern New Territories region of the Outer Rim Territories, located near both the Sinsang and Anger systems, Dantuine was the fourth planet in orbit of its star Dina, and was orbited by two moons. The principal moon shone a light purple, while the lesser had a greenish cast. 
What really was the main points of interest on this remote planet was its GD temple that had very recently been abandoned with little no operations still taking place. Just outside the view of Dantuine's major city simply known as Dantu Town, Wraith had settled down. Unsure of what his next course of action, he ponders. If he wanted to escape and get off of this planet and head to the core worlds, possibly Coruscant he would need to take the hyperspace lanes, but he does not know whether or not the threat of the explosive device was even real. It could all be faked, and his father was taking it too seriously. Considering his actions though he remembers the basic information from the sector, in particular Dantuine's hyperspace lanes. Two hyperspace lanes ran near Dantuine, the long winding Viragi trade route, and the smaller Mito's Arrow, a backwater route from Dantuine to Jemus, offered a faster trip. Despite being close to both lanes, Dantuine was not easily accessible. From what species mainly lived on Dantuine were humans even if they were not native, they were the only known inhabitants with no other sentient species originating from this planet, and no others wishing to settle here. I may need to wait out the results of what my father had informed of me. Only then will I know truly if the Zychar have successfully pinpointed the coordinates of where I am. If this is true I may need to consider the possibility of someone betraying me from the inside. Most of my researchers were selected through a official selection on merit-based process, but that does not mean that the testing period is infallible, and it is entirely possible one of the members of my division gave up the information. Or more likely as a part of the Zychar. Going from that line of thought, Wraith decides to at least get a better idea of his surrounding area, while remaining hidden to make sure he was not followed. So he puts on display his amazing intellect and talent in regards to mechanics and programming, and uses a small droid he personally designed and be used in scout-type missions. Ahead of its time most would say, but he believes it could still be improved upon, especially since he did not originally designed it, and was currently within its prototype phase, but he had modified it to work better. Obviously what he means by not by his design, is that it was not originally created by him, where he had acquired most of his ideas by commandeering it through his otherwise grey moral jobs through espionage. He gets to work and not 20 minutes later he has completed enough to where it could function, and allow him to view the area through a limited function. What he did not know was that this little droid would be what was needed work another party to make itself known, and give him a deal him could not refuse. Tatooine. Throughout the past two months nothing much has changed or developed all too much. The business was going nicely, his mother had become more accepting of his mature attitude and outlook despite his actual age. Given him more freedoms and his army of droids were coming along nicely. Even if they had thoughts of going against our verbal agreement, in the end it wouldn't matter much since I had direct control over all of their current droids and weaponry, through the use of Mekuderu. Progress has been slow on the front of developing my force powers and or abilities. It would seem Anakin would need to take on a master or several, and he could do that by going to the GD. It is a part of his plan anyway to infiltrate and take as much valuable information from the GD archives on Coruscant within their sacred temple. With my created force techniques I had hit a plateau with my telepathic-based abilities and couldn't develop it further, and with mental intrusions I suspect will take some time, a lot of people and harder mental barriers to either break or sneak through. Mekuderu has also slowly started to come to a halt. It seems unfortunately that without proper guidance, I would not be able to make it too far. Despite the seemingly limitless supply of space junk he could reassemble into something somewhat of a standing army the droid he currently has, or the quality of the parts for his droids, are quite low and old, going by galactic standards. Watto's junkyard really was a junkyard. Repurposing medic and communication-based droids into working proper combat droids was tough work at least at first. It had gotten better over time as his Mekuderu skill increased in combination with his talent and mechanics inherited from the original Anakin. Another factor to take into account was my mother's well-being, how she had been doing and what she was doing, and for now she had been and is content with what she has now, leaving most decision-making to me. That's right, Shmai Skywalker his mother, has left most decisions whether they be major on him. He wouldn't have it any other way, as it gives him all freedoms and liberties needed with her as a stand-in for him, until he is old enough to legitimately take control of the business. Talking about the development of the business, some interesting things have come to Anakin's attention. A message that had a holographic recording sent to him from his droid team set up on Dantuine. He wanted to rope in the CNR before Sidious did, and he knows the Sith Lord did not gain access or persuade them yet, and would do it sometime during the Clone Wars. If they could be made as it would not only cripple Sidious and whatever machinations he has for the future, but would also benefit me greatly. Either as some form of financial support or otherwise through some blackmailing and persuasive seduction, not of the sexual kind as Wraith Sienor is not swayed by that, I mean the sway of power I would gain an ally that would help me build up my technology. The reason as to why I did not meet either Wraith or Naro, was because I am one a child, and two have no backing whatsoever, meaning there is little chance they would take me seriously or see me as any kind of threat to them. So through droid proxy, I am able to get my point across whilst at the same time maintain my anonymity. What I had coerced out of saving their assess was not something petty, but would be of major help to my cause. My cause being the freedom of the slaves on my homeworld planet, Tatooine. 
Of course I have more reasons other than this, but I also disliked the idea of slavery, and it wouldn't do well for my character and psyche if I just ignored it. Overthrowing the ruling power will take some time, and will most likely not happen until around the Clone Wars is in progress. Through Anakin's anonymity he bypasses a lot of the hassle most would go through when trying to execute some shady deal as intimidation factor is key, and if the heavily modified droids despite their age did not work, he would have to find another route to explore. Through the senior father-son duo, it would be easier and much more possibly to register the business currently Shadow owned by himself to become legitimate. There was another task that would be worthwhile investigating, but for now it could be put on hold. The potential behind the dark side magics of the Dathomirian Zabrak on Dathomir. Dathomir, nicknamed the Rancor Planet, is a remote, neutral and obscure planet in the Quelly Sector, and the home of the Night Sisters, Night Brothers, Blue Coral Divers Clan, Singing Mountain, and the Howling Crag. The planet, bathed in blood red light by its central star, had numerous continents that were overrun with vegetation, forests, and swamplands. The dark side of the Force had an immensely strong presence on Dathomir, which allowed for the nurturing of many malevolent Force wielders native to the planet. The Night Sisters, also known as the Dathomir Witches, made their home in the swamps and wielded magics fueled by Dathomir's own power. Dathomir was also home to the Night Brothers, Zabrax, who were ruled by the Night Sisters. It was also the homeworld of the semi sentient Vranker species. Dathomir was a remote and uninviting world, although it was temperate and verdant, with a comfortable atmosphere despite its challenging ecosystem and dangerous predators. Perpetually bathed in a red mist, its terrain was one of contrasts, ranging from the murky swamps the Night Sisters lived in, to the harsh barren rocks where the Night Brothers found residence. Dathomir's natural inhabitants were well adapted to the planet's harsh conditions, and some, such as the Rancor, were famed for their combative skill. Other native creatures included bane back spiders, large and aggressive arachnids that spat corrosive acid, and night axe bipedal predators with powerful arms that allowed them to easily traverse the landscape. Among the most distinctive creatures native to Dathomir, however, was the Chiridactyl, a gargantuan bat-like creature that used its massive wings to fly to dizzying heights and swoop down on unwary prey. Dathomir also had aquatic life, such as the burra fish. Fishing families on the planet Batu cooked and cultivated the foreign burra fish for consumption. Another aquatic creature, the Sleeper, was an ancient mollusk with two large lavender eyes, a carapace-covered body, antennae, and four appendages, and lived deep in the murky blue water within the Night Sister lair. The Sleeper was very important in Night Sister tradition, as it had an ingredient vital in the water of life. Dathomir. Two years after freeing himself Anakin had boarded one of his many acquired ships, and had taken himself taking with him and leaving some droids behind. Ahead of time he had also sent many other droids to arrive at the planet before he did, to give himself an easier time once he got there. I have taken a calculated risk coming here to Dathomir, what with its many dangers and the strong influence of the dark side on this planet. One of the main risks was the possibility of Sidious coming here, even after he had taken everything he had wanted from the planet. I doubt that would happen though. Prior to the Battle of Naboo, the Sith Lord Darth Sidious went to Dathomir, who was at the time plotting his rise to galactic supremacy, then he traded secrets of the dark side of the Force, with the Night Sister's leader, Mother Talzin. He took Talzin's son, the Night Brother Maul as his apprentice. Talzin's relevance here is that she is the current shaman and the clan mother of the Night Sisters, a coven of four sensitive witches who use magics to manipulate the wilderness around them and rule their male counterparts, the Night Brothers. Talzin's expertise in magics was significant enough to attract the attention of the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious, whom when he came to Dathomir ostensibly and wanted to trade dark side force teachings with Talzin and take her as his own Sith apprentice. Their relationship brought Sidious to proclaim that he would make Talzin his Sith apprentice and right hand, but was ultimately unfulfilled. Instead, the Dark Lord sensed the potential of the young Maul and abducted him from Talzin, taking the child away from his kinsman and heritage on Dathomir. Years later, Maul would be presumed dead at the Battle of Naboo, after sustaining mortal injuries, but his strength in the dark side allowed him to remain just barely alive. In canon she would be aware of Maul's incredible survival, she was unable to rescue him, and thus remained on Dathomir to plot her revenge against Sidious and his Sith, with her ultimate goal being galactic domination. I could use these facts to my advantage and the multiple other factors to persuade her into doing the special ritual the Dathomir Zabrak that get to become a member of either the Dark Sisters or Dark Brothers on myself. At the same time I realize the difficulty in trying to convince her because of the multiple betrayals she has experienced. So one of the methods to make sure everything is within my control is to leverage my position with the ability to overpower them. The droid army I have been accumulating has grown significantly with control of senior technologies. Mother Talzin's main loyalties laid with the Night Sisters and with her son Maul, and her primary goals were to exact revenge against Darth Sidious and eventually rule the galaxy alongside her son. In service to these grander aims she was duplicitous and manipulative, able to control various different factions in a puppetmaster-like fashion to achieve her goals, all while maintaining a facade of loyalty to her various underlings, who were none the wiser to her true intentions. 
Being a powerful force sensitive in her own right and having delved deep into the dark side, it was not enough, and she was ultimately overcome and defeated by Sidious. She possessed a shrewd and tactical mind, and was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Sith Lord for a time, accurately predicting his movements and adjusting her own strategies accordingly. Despite the dark side used predominantly by this group, the Dark Sisters and Dark Brothers would not consider themselves a part of the Sith, despite similarities in powers and teachings. They had their own culture and background influencing what is important and not important for them. As the leader of her Night Sisters, Talzin taught them to be loyal to nobody except each other, and to only focus on themselves and their sisters. As their leader and shaman, the Night Sisters obeyed her orders without question, as did her other followers, such as the Frangal cult. While she did care for the Night Sisters, Talzin's greatest attachment was to her beloved son Maul, which ran contrary to her culture that viewed males as expendable tools for breeding. After losing Maul to her former partner Darth Sidious, Talzin wished to rescue him. Yet another fact that could be used to manipulate her, as when the original plot of the story begins, I could have a hand in saving Maul from having his body cut in two by Obi-Wan. Talzin's regard for Night Brothers other than Maul seemed more in line with the Night Sisters' matriarchal tendencies, despite this, males under her command respected her leadership and showed concern for her well-being and were trusted with guarding the heart of her power at the Night Brother village. The most important aspect of her importance was her knowledge in the Force in general, the knowledge in the special rituals using Sith magics and her position as the leader of her people. Roping her into my side will be difficult as she has her own ambitions which include in favorite child. Anyway the primary reason and objective being on such a dangerous planet is to take advantage of the dark side rituals and magics for myself. Talzin, a Dathomarian female with white colored skin and silver eyes, stood at 2.23 meters tall. Given that the average height of Dathomarians vary greatly, it is not weird seeing one so tall. Even so among her pairs and various subordinates, not many would reach her height both within the females and males of her species and of those dark sisters and dark brothers enhanced by the ritual. What is going on outside? Thought the shaman as some noises are heard from outside her living quarters. On the planet of Dathomir at a specific location within a cave-like structure was what is known as the Night Sisters Fortress. The Night Sisters Fortress is the settlement of which the Night Sisters, led by Talzin, makes their home. Hidden away from most visitors and inhabitants the caves provide warmth and appropriate spots to make home with building built into grand pillars, extending upwards and holding the roof of the cave. Various constructed stone pathways spiraling around and across the lake at the bottom of the cave. Currently a commotion was happening from within, and the residents are unsettled by the approaching small army of droids just outside the periphery of the encampment. Most Night Sisters located here are warriors and are housed here from their birth and into the foreseeable future as well. What could be documented was the lack of males within, pointing towards the settlement being a matriarchy. While the droids set up outside the Night Sisters are confused, slightly distraught and panicked about the situation, but ever the semi-trained combatants they quickly arm themselves ready for combat. Those who live on Dathomir know to stay away from the Night Sisters, and most residents and frequent visitors on the planet try not to associate with them. Going outside Talzin assesses the situation, while her personal escorts are just outside ready to report what's going on. Some may be confused as to why no one had just entered her house, but without her permission, one simply cannot enter without her say, and one must wait until she is done with whatever she is doing. Most of the time she would be using her unnatural connection to the Force, through her magics and special enchanted crystal orb, that allows her to peer into the future, but she didn't foresee this incoming invasion. Mother Shaman, there appears to be intruders upon our sacred home. There are no other beings in sight, but multiple metal constructs. Replies one the many sisters. Something within the Force was telling her that this intruder was not as simple as they seem, but employing cannon fodder instead of oneself at risk on the battlefield is a very smart move against multiple semi-trained Force-sensitive individuals. Spread out on my command, I will announce myself to this threat and see what they have come here for. The planet and the Force is warning me of something, and it is unsettling. Talzin speaks and sends out multiple commands throughout her ranks, while making sure she would be safe, for she still has not completed her ambition. At your command Mother Shaman. Spoke in unison the several armed Dathomarian females around her. Slowly approaching while at the same time proactively trying to sense the outcome of the situation, and what keeping an eye out for anything resembling a presence within the force whether it one she is familiar with or not, she speaks out looking for a response. Intruders, you have come into our sacred home. I demand you make yourself known. Amplifying her voice through the force to get her point across. I demand you make yourself known. A distance away from the main buildings of the Dark Sisters fortress is the young human boy known as Anakin. I was not expecting such a welcoming, or maybe I was. Anakin thought as he was surrounded in a formation by several modified combat droids, whom were prepared to defend their master. Getting ready to respond Anakin instead of amplifying his voice through the voice, does not have the proper technique or training in being able to pull off such a trick, uses a device instead to not only slightly mask his voice, but make sure he is heard. My name is Anakin Skywalker, a human child that has come in search for the infamous power gifted by the special rituals of your people. His voice resounds throughout and echoes within the cave. Anakin Skywalker? 
A human child has come to seek us out for our power. To use our traditional rituals for himself, this sounds like a trick of the Sith. Talzin speaks, but she cannot help but respond with some venom in her tone, vocalizing some of her thoughts. I am aware of your hostile attitude with the Sith Lord known as Darth Sidious. I also wish to discuss about some revenge I would like to take against a Sith, and would like to destroy them. Still talking Anakin, uses some basic alignment tactics in his speech to have the Dark Sisters as a whole regard him as an ally. If only a temporary one. Oh. And what can you provide in helping me? My clan and the people I lead, revenge for what? Talzin not falling into the temptation while maintaining she is unconcerned by the kidnapping of her child. I only ask we speak on peaceful terms, as my main goal for coming here is to participate in the ritual that I have heard is to begin soon. Anakin replies leaving the earlier topic of revenge, knowing Talzin would not speak about it in the open. I had come here before, and have lost faith in like-minded individuals from outside my people. Tell me why we should not engage in combat right now? Of course this is but a bluff, especially since the Force is warning her to not engage in combat, that ominous feeling is something she would trust given the nature of her powers. I wish to gain power myself, but I am also willing to trade some things in exchange. I also will say I will leave myself at your mercy with no protection, if that will mollify your intent for battle, but be aware if I am unable to return safely, it will come at a cost to yourself. The minute passes by, but eventually trusting in her powers, Talzin decides to agree and take this chance to see what the human child has to offer, while at the same time ordering her members around to take some precaution. Can be having a similar instance as with Sidious. Okay, your conditions are acceptable. Dathomir. One might think, giving myself up and putting myself in potential harm's way is dangerous, but it may be the only possible way to alleviate the worries of the Dark Sisters. The Dark Sisters themselves are more aligned with the dark side of the Force, and would be better to make sure my intentions are known from the start, otherwise distrust will be present, and distrust will lead them into being cautious. There is also their own culture that works against me at the current moment. Their distaste of any male of their species, and it extends even past their species and onto others. That is their culture based around a matriarch, and the current matriarch is Talzin, who is considered both their spiritual leader otherwise culturally known as their shaman, and serves as the general leader as well, also known as the mother. Despite their view of males to be used as breeding stock, I should be able to reform them given enough time, and transform them into reasonable subordinates. For now they would be acceptable allies until I start to turn them into my own army of force-sensitive soldiers. Being led to another built-in spire-like structure that is also a supporting pillar for the cave's roof. Talzin is walking in front of Anakin with multiple other female Dathomarian flanking Anakin on either side with a few more behind. What an escort, are they that afraid of a child? I shouldn't be that imposing, but possibly it could be a multitude of things considering Talzin is supposed to be some kind of psychic that can see into the future. Deciding to speak up, Anakin starts to see if they would talk to him before any negotiations start. What a nice place you girls live in. Silence is given in reply as no one wants to speak to the outsider. Upon entering the building Anakin can see a few additions that he previously could not view before from a distance. The structure and the people. The Night Sisters, also known as the Witches of Dathomir or Daughters of Dathomir, were a clan and order of magic-wielding females. These dark side users were able to perform their arcane magics by tapping into the magical itcher that flowed from the depths of their planet. From what I remember of the history for the Dark Sisters came to be. According to a commonly told story, the first Night Sisters were trained in the ways of the Force by Alia, a female Jedi whom the Jedi Council had sent into exile on the mysterious planet of Dathomir. However, the Jedi Council had no records of an exile named Alia, and the Night Sisters themselves had other, contradicting tales about their origins. Even if she was not the founder of the Sisters, Alia also wrote the Book of Law that taught the Sisters to dislike the Jedi. The dislike for the Sith has only been developed very recently because of Sidious. When the Fromprath, a sentient snake-like, six-armed species that came to Dathomir and exploited the natural resources of the planet. The Night Sisters opposed this technological invasion, forming a symbiotic alliance with the Rankers in order to drive out the colonizers. They mounted them in combat and succeeded in driving the colonizers out of the soil of Dathomir. Knowing that technologically advanced aliens posed a threat to Coven, the Night Sisters modernized some of their weapons, such as their energy bows. This is why today even if the current Night Sisters aren't up to standards with the rest of the galaxy at large, they have remnants of their own advancements when it comes to their culture. This can be seen in their weaponry, overall in their clothing and armor as well. I happened to overhear some stories that was being passed around, legends to be specific about the feats different members of the Night Sisters supposedly achieved. Most stories were told to some children, of course mostly female, and the stories are based off of other female members. According to legend, the Night Sister Zeldin went after the Sith Darth Kaldath, after he stole a burial pod from Dathomir. Zeldin attempted to manipulate Kaldath into causing his own death out of revenge, but Kaldath was aware of Zeldin's presence, exploiting their connection before trapping her consciousness within his mind. One of the Night Sisters' weaponry, though a weapon used more commonly by Jedi, the Night Sisters had adopted light whips by the High Republic era. 
Another weakness of the clans was their over-reliance on the planet's abilities, as they do get their powers from the planet, at least, that was mostly during height of the Galactic Republic right now. Since their power was at its most potent on their home planet, the Night Sisters rarely ventured off-world. However, this changed when a sister named Talzin became the clan's mother. That is right, the very same Talzin leading me now to a location I am unsure of. Soon enough within a few years, Talzin would turn the Night Sisters here into a mercenary group to the galaxy's wealthy citizens, and this would happen during the Clone Wars. Another instance or semi-major event was when the clan was forced to give up the young Asajj Ventress to the Sinatine criminal Halstead as insurance for protection, but it would seem just as a member could be stolen from them, they could others to make up for their loses. A couple years before the Clone Wars, Talzin would come to tell the Witch of No Clan Falta to give up her daughter, Yenna. After Falta declined, Yenna slowly became frustrated with her mother's teachings, and one day left to join the Night Sisters in hopes of different teaching. As one could see their culture has been influenced from the start from the person who supposedly created the Night Sisters to the continued conflicts that reinforce their cultural development. This was. Spoke Talzin breaking me from my thoughts. Of course. I responded, as we have now come across a room not too dissimilar to a negotiations table. It seems they would like to talk a little more first. Please child, take a seat. Thank you, you have been most accommodating. Good manners should count for something, I do not want to lower my position in their eyes, but I also shouldn't speak as if I am some superior. Good, now tell me again just so I know why you are here? Well I too would be confused if a child starts a small cold war. Anakin then starts to speak. I am going to supply you with droids, whether they be used for protocols, combat or for educative reasons. We do not need droids. Talzin says. I doubt that considering these droids could be used to improve the quality of life for you people, but I do have more things to offer. Like what? Talzin questions curious. I am aware that here on this backwater planet that is powerful as you guys are, you lack the necessary technological advancements to help build yourselves up. The lack of a proper economy to the lack in population. Talzin thinks on his words and agrees. That is true. So I wish to exchange with you ships. Starships capable of transporting you and your people throughout the galaxy along with droids. Anakin then continues. In exchange I would like to participate in the ritual you have, but before that be briefed on what could happen. The advantages and possible disadvantages I could gain. Anakin thinks. I do have a general idea, but it is better to ask directly from the source. I do like your conditions, but you take so little compared to what we gain. I also wish to use Dathomir as a planet to harbor my droid army. Thinking it over, Talzin comes to a decision. I agree. After the lengthy discussion I was finally able to at least my primary goal of coming here. Well get them to at least come to an agreement with myself and allowing me to go through their ritual. Immediately after that meeting took place, I was taken away and hurriedly shooed from the inside of the building. I guess they do not want me taking up too much of their time. They also informed me of when the ritual will take place, so I guess there is that and I have been told I am allowed to stay within, but I must allow surveillance on me for the entirety of my stay. Information other than when the ritual would take place and the location was what would happen in general, and the consequences if I were to fail in completing or getting to the end of it. Of course there were also the projected benefits of partaking in the ritual. Death, death is the absolute worst thing that would happen, and considering that the population has experienced a massive increase despite the many years that has passed since the creation of the settlement, one could presume most of this can be attributed to the ritual. In the end only the strongest of the strong survive, whether that be in the ritual which is quite unfortunate given most species do not just survive in through pure strength alone. Luck, mutations and adaptions for different environments. From what I understand the ritual is conducted by the spiritual leader, their shaman and the participants are those who are younger, preferably before the age of five, as if the ritual is done later in life, there are no benefits to be had, other than it being a ceremony of sorts. This luxury would only be afforded to the females as well. Most of the practices of what the Night Sisters do is recorded in the Book of Law, a tome of moral and ethical teachings kept and modified by each clan based on an original created by Alia for her daughters. Then there was another form of magics practiced originating from Javzerian, called Shadow Magic was the provenance of the Night Sisters that did not require chanting or other primitive rituals. After the ritual is complete, it would be used to enhance one's features, increasing bodily capacity in areas like strength, speed, reaction and other things, which would result in the increase of their height, the rapidly development of their bodies, and growth and prominence in features like hair, horns and larger, taller physiques. This was specifically done by Talzin on Savage Operas at some point in the future, the downside to the ritual though was the increase in sensitivity and becoming much more influenced by the dark side of the force. Operas was especially transformed and made him into an avatar of primal anger. This is exactly what I was looking for. Why? Because I want to experience growth at an accelerated rate because I dislike being a child again, but also the power increase I would get. Yes the potential downsides does bring my expectations down, but I believe I would be able to mitigate if not downright negate this negative, through the use of my created mental defenses. 
All of this along with my hypothesis that it also somehow increased the force sensitivity of an individual, which I think would lead to an increase in your midi-chlorians per cell. Being able to grow faster with increased physical capabilities to speed up my progress will definitely help me. A few days had passed and the time had come to participate in the grand ritual conducted by Talzin, with the use of dark side magics. Again being somewhat confined and heavily monitored is certainly annoying, it is a worthwhile sacrifice of freedom for what I will get in return. No doubt I am also of the same mind I could be misled, but the feeling I get through the force is definitely positive, and I'll get what I want, so either way I win. I would go to my backup plan and just try and learn the ritual myself by stealing the Book of Law. Interrupted by being led into a deeper part of the cave, the entrance gives way to a ceremonial center or podium, and all around the center was Dathomerian children, specifically the gender of male. Standing on the podium and all around the edges of the shallow glowing water the children have been put into is Talzin. Anakin quickly hops into the special water along with the others, ages ranging around 3 to 5 years of age. Poor sods. There is barely anything I can do about, and I do not really want to help them much either given a ritual like this is something I have next to no experience with. Children and my sisters, we are gathered here today to help further strengthen the members of our people. Talzin does not have to speak very loud for her words to be heard. We will begin the ritual shortly Talzin starts to weird symbolic gestures, and the water slightly increases in brightness. The accompanying night sisters at the edges of the shallow pool also start to use weird chants in a language I have only briefly overheard the women doing in the epicenter of the fortress. The little boys are otherwise terrified either because are aware enough of the situation they have been forced into, or simply because they do not what is about to happen, and fear of the unknown is powerful. I am starting to feel something within this water. Similar to the force, but unnaturally connected. The energy is converted from Talzin and the other participants into the water, then started to fuse into the boys one by one. The process seems painful, painful enough for multiple to start falling unconscious. Arg. Anakin lets out a gasp as he too starts to feel pain spread throughout his body, instinctively he passively and actively pulls up his control of the force and tries to cut off, or at least ease the pain by dulling his senses. It was no lie when she told me it would be painful. Struggling for dear life, trying to make sure he not only survives the process but is also able to maintain consciousness, but just like every other member he is thrown to his knees and passes out. Let's just hope nobody will do anything to me. At least I have Servi before he could finish that thought be head first falls into the water. Coruscant. On the planet of Coruscant, within the Galactic City, Senate District the Jedi Temple built by the founding four masters is an iconic point of interest. The Jedi's knowledge, history, and other facilities including the housing of the Jedi masters, knights, padawans and younglings. Within one of the many small rooms used for the Jedi, sparse in decoration with next to nothing at all distinctly lacking color, but of high value in cleanliness, one would see a distinct diminutive, wrinkly and old green alien. The Grandmaster of the GD High Council and the GD Overall, Yoda. Floating above the ground in a meditative state, GD Master Yoda is practicing his use of the Force and trying to see into the future or at least feel the Force around himself. Despite the peace with the Galactic Republic a storm has been brewing for a long time now, and it doesn't help the senses of the GD are clouded. Most, if not all of the Order had been coming across a problem, the lack of foresight reliable enough for their future and the future of the galaxy. Troubled times have already begun to spread. When the GD truly noticed their inability to see and peer into the Force, that could not identify the problem, the cause of such a disturbance. There was only one point in time with which they could feel a major event happen, and that was five years ago. That strong presence in the Force that seemed to cut through the haze and enter the minds of those truly attuned. Yoda himself and other masters, including all of those on the GD Council felt it, and probably other Force-sensitive individuals whom have a strong connection. After that incident, a few younglings and padawans who had high midi-chlorian counts had asked their masters or teachers what the feeling was themselves. This event of even younglings being affected further increased the possibility of the event being real and not orchestrated by any dark side powers. It happened again. Just once more, right at this instance while Yoda meditated, but this time it was stronger, clearer and much more pronounced. Resounding with much more emphasis and power no doubt meaning more than just a most talented or powerful within the force can feel this push. Unfortunately, he has the feeling that not himself or anyone would be able to locate the source just like the last time. The reason to avoid the call this time is the different in the feeling, whereas this time it feels darker and not in line with the ideals or teachings of the GD, but also in spite of this, he would want to investigate simply because the GD are the natural enemies of the dark side of the force and their users. Hmm. A small humming noise made in contemplation is made from Yoda. Hmm, I wonder would be best in the investigation. Should I? Or should it be someone experienced in the identification of the dark powers, Master Windu, perhaps? Yoda thought to himself. While Yoda is in a meditative that had just been interrupted, various other Force-sensitive individuals within the temple also felt the pulse through the Force. All Masters, most knights and many talented Padawans and younglings, eager to question upon what they had felt. 
The curiosity only grew within both the adults and children alike, especially in those who had felt the first pulse five years ago, and despite the passage of time it was a memorable event. I think Master Windu would do fine in the exploration of this presence. He is most experienced. Yoda making his decision internally calls out and the preparation of the second meeting regarding the pulse would begin. The discussion would have the GD Master tasked in finding the source, but in the end not being able to locate it. Frustration, anger, despair and many other emotions mixed together, but mainly those emanate from the diplomatic Chancellor Palpatine. The reason for the strong felt emotions fueling his dark side abilities was that pulse. The annoyingly powerful, irritating pulse through the force. Punished, he was and punished more for his failure at being able to come up with any results for that pulse. He believed he would be fine, unpunished by his master, too busy looking for ways to gain eternal life, but it seems in spite of his master's obsession, he had time enough to teach him a lesson he had learned long ago. Now, it has come to attention and his master that the same pulse that appeared five years ago, has made a reappearance, stronger than before, and greatly more in tune with the dark side of the force. Again he had been reminded of this failure that was not supposed to be of much significance. Hate. He has come to hate this presence, when, and he meant when he finds the source he would utterly destroy it. Vent his hatred towards it built over the years. He never knew his hatred for something he knows next to nothing about would reach this far, but that is corruption of the dark side influencing him and his thoughts. Power like the power he has does come at a cost, and unfortunately it does not only affect the body, it also affects the mind. When I get my hands on whatever it is causing me so much trouble Sidious in his thoughts bruise in anger. Sidious was not the only one to take some punishment, so too did his own apprentice he has been trying to cultivate, Darth Maul. In the mind of Sidious his apprentice, Maul had failed him when it was meant to be his mission to succeed in, and by failing him there are consequences. Physical and mental torture continued on a daily basis is nothing new to Sidious some other forms of punishment are created. Anyway, back to the point, Sidious was once again tasked with the same mission of finding the source. His master, even though obsessed with the idea of eternal life, has enough frame of mind to punish him, and be even more increasingly interested with outside sources of interest. Anything with some connection to the dark side of the force is another potential source of information or pieces of the puzzle for his search. While Sidious himself is also interested in many things to do with the dark side of the force, including eternal life, he right now is more focused on building himself up to a position where his plans may come to fruition. Anything else could wait. At least he would have had more time until the interest of his master was piqued. The new general direction he has been able to sense has given him the ability to locate the system the pulse originated from. The only way he was able to even find the general location for the source was because of the nature of the pulse. It seems to originate from the outer rims region. I should have my apprentice I have been grooming investigate again. His failure might have been forgiven the first time with only a light punishment, but this time he had better not fail me again. Sidious within his expensive and high-class room on the planter of Coruscant, in the Senate District, mulls over many things, and uses his extremely powerful foresight-based abilities to plan around this disturbance. I can't be leaving because it is an interruption, but Maul would have to do for now. Reaching out to a communication device specifically used for his persona as the Sith Lord Sidious, he reaches and calls out to his apprentice Maul, because his apprentice is currently out training at this time, when he could be put to better use in search of the source. To make up for his past failures not only to himself but for himself, he may reward him. Unfortunately again, no rewards would be had even if he completed the mission for his master, the obsessed lunatic he is. That would be his downfall. Sidious thought to himself and slight glee over the idea of usurping his master. The communication device beeps for a second, and with no hesitation is immediately answered. Master, I was just finishing my training. Why have you called? A blue holographic figure appears from the device, and the figure is appears in Sidious's face. Of course the features can be seen, but the coloring of the individual, but Maul is a Dathomarian Zabrak with devilish features, spiked horns at the crown of his head, red and black patterned skin with the signature burning yellow red eyes that signifies one's alignment to the dark side. Yes, my apprentice. Letting the silence fall to create tension, as he is one for Thetric Sidious then continues. I have called to task you with a mission. Sidious again pauses, but this time waits for an answer, to reinforce his dominance over the teenage Maul. Yes master, I accept. Maul does not hesitate to reply within not a millisecond. Good good. My apprentice, your mission is the same as the one taken five years ago that I used to access your progress. You must find the pulse in its exact location discreetly. Do you understand your task? Finishing off in a questioning tone in the end with slight undertones of what would happen if he failed, again. Yes, master. Another reply that was answered with haste. You are to start within the Outer Rim territories, for that was where it was generally sensed and do practice with some caution, as currently we do not have any information on who or what it is. I wouldn't want my favorite apprentice to die. Again ominously Sidious speaks to the holographic form of the Zabrak. I will not fail you master. Good good you shall begin right away. Before Maul could reply the communication was cut off. Now I just have to wait and see whether or not my apprentice can come up with anything. If Maul fails me I have more than enough options to explore for my future apprentice. Back on Dathomir. Erg. 
my head kind of hurts. Awakening to something akin to a morning hangover headache was the small form of Anakin Skywalker. Where am I? Wait I remember. Slowly getting up and adjusting to his surroundings, he is semi-surprised by the room he is in. Yes the ritual the Dark Sisters magic ritual has been completed, and Anakin has no idea of the casualties, and has no idea of the exact changes he has gone through, even with a general idea and other hypotheses made. Time to check myself. Getting up Anakin spreads his senses within the Force to see if anyone can be detected around him through the Force. Nobody, at least no one is in a close vicinity to me. Looking around the room it is sparse and he is the only one within. Obviously the walls are made of bricked smooth stone, which is the general architecture used in the caves of the Night Sisters' fortress. Getting up he approaches the door and is not so surprised he is a bit physically off balance. I guess I went through a mini growth spurt, which is perfect for me. I do not mind a kid again all too much, but it would be much better to be full size again. Exiting the door, he enters a hallway and at the end is another door probably leading to the outside. Upon exiting he is able to guess his general location is somewhere outside of the inner fortress. Wow. Such generous hosts. Anakin approaches the water to see if he could see his reflection, but he could not. I doubt I looked that much different, and it is much more possible I might have a brighter hair color and or might more vibrant eyes, something like that. One thing for sure though is the height. It is enough to where I could feel a difference. There are other consequences to the completion and survival of the ritual. An example would be savage operas, their magic was used or will be used sometime in the future to enhance his features, longer horns, taller, and larger physique. These changes obviously came at the cost of turning him into an avatar of primal anger. I wonder how it would affect me if it would at all. Primary ingredients that are used for the ritual include their infamous water of life. Somewhat similar to how the, the legendary fountain of youth, it helps a person recuperate some sever damage. The water of life was a liquid used by the Night Sisters of Dathomir to heal. Its ingredients included water, flesh extracted from the sleeper, minerals, and tree sap. Brewing the concoction was a rite of passage for a Night Sister. A Night Sister would use her force abilities to awaken the sleeper, dominate it, and force it to remove a piece of its body. The body part would be boiled with water from the deep pools of the Night Sister fortress, and the other ingredients would be added. Quite a gruesome process, but I wouldn't expect any less from a magic-based force technique. Besides the benefits from the ritual, at least to me outweigh any disadvantages. Dathomir. Within the inner sanctums of the infamous Dark Sisters fortress was none other than their leader, Shaman Mother Talzin. Only a few days ago she had come to know of a seemingly prodigious child smart enough or mature enough to converse properly with adults. This human child was a surprise considering most human children that age were stupid, with little to no capabilities in emotional control. At first it was the child being in control of the small army of droids that had come into their sacred cavern, but he was talented enough to be able to hide his presence within the Force, from not only every member strong with the Force, but also herself. Her talents did not see the boy coming, and her foresight was a gift she cultivated and was most of the time right in her visions, but it had failed her before in the kidnapping of her son. This time was different though, she foresaw Sidious coming, and was at least able to tell he was force sensitive, but the boy interacted with the force, as if it did not sense him. Other surprises like his goals of coming here to Dathomir just for a potentially lethal ritual that would only give so much power was certainly shocking. Even more so that I could not feel anything, and that kept me on edge. What the boy offered was enough at least for now to allow him to go through the ritual. He offered to help supply us with equipment to improve our quality of life. Droids whether they be in tune with combat, medic, or otherwise other activities like teaching to improve general education. Certainly the deal was advantages for our side. In return he would create an alliance with the Dark Sisters of sorts, where he would continue to support us and our development, with grand and ambitious plans to take control of the planet of Dathomir completely. He planned out well how to increase the population, giving example of other things to increases as well. Trade was brought as something important, and what he brought to the table was of value. An example being spacecrafts. He would in the future help supply spacecrafts of various kinds, event though in general, it is not needed for the clan it may be in the future. Hell, he may have even not survived, most children do not, and I was unsure if even a human could participate and have the same or similar results. For all I knew he could have exploded. The boy had confidence at least, or he did not show his fear. Again that level of emotional control should be more than enough to set off alarms within anyone's head, especially at the age he was. Only 5 years old. At least he fit the requirements in being able to participate. The few days wait was over, and when it came to the main event, he had showed up just as he had promised and wanted. The ritual included instructions passed down from their ancestor, whom had started out as a GD, but later became disillusioned to their teachings. So she supposedly recorded and created her own way through the use of the dark side of the force, and special magics that can over generations built up upon successive generations. The Book of Laws had a lot of details, and most of its magics included ritualistic and symbolic gestures with some connections to the force. The ritual usually only increased physical capabilities when done on adults, and did not increase one's sensitivity to the force. 
The workaround was to start early, preferably at the age range between 3 to 5 years of age, unfortunately though this increased the risk of fatality. This influenced their culture yet again, but making them value those who were strong. Unfortunately my mate that I had chosen died shortly after my last child Maul and I, and become too old to continue having more children, so there was the need for another mate. Rituals done on children, both female and male. Despite the favoritism cultivated in the culture of Dathomirian Zabrak for women, the chances of surviving were equal for both genders of children. This time it was the males of their species, and only those chosen were of a decent force sensitivity. They have ways to identify them through the magics, and do not need to rely on technology like the Kurinjiti to find children strong in the force. Force-sensitive children are more likely survive is the simple reason that they were preferred. The ritual this year would have gone like any other, and everything was going fine, even with the odd child out, most children here were brought from either outside to ensure we did not do too much inbreeding amongst each other. They were scared, some knew of the stories of what is to happen to them, or at least fantasized stories anyway. Most would not survive anyway, so it would be quite cruel to give them false hope. So I did exactly that. Once the ritual began, the usual panicking and cries of agony and pain also began. Passing out left, right and center with many probably dying. What left Talzin and the others participating in the ritual however was the human child and his resilience, undoubtedly if he was a male Zabrak and or of our culture, he would be a suitable candidate for the mate selection process. What happened next however was more surprising and quite frightening. The dark energies of the planet started to respond and more kind to my call, no the call of the human child Anakin. The conductor, leader of the event myself had lost control once the ritual started to affect him, and as if the force itself was answering the call of its one true master, imbued itself into his being. The energy and pressure I felt and no doubt my sisters as well was great forcing me to my needs. I hated that. As if I was to prostrate to a chosen individual of the planet, and it had to be a male. If only it was a female, even if of a different species, I would not have felt the disgust I did in that moment as much I did. It had only taken a few seconds, but it felt as if a few days had gone by, but just as quickly as it started it had finished. I cautiously approached a human child, while the others either checked on the other children, or helped to back up my approach. No words need to be spoken, and in cinch with each other, the small group of women had gotten within physical touching distance. Reaching out her hand to the child she was able to determine he was still alive, still extraordinarily so, and despite her reservations she was shocked again. After that, Anakin had been taken to the outer parts of the fortress. Despite being a child and having the potential to permanently end him there in his state of vulnerability, again the force had warned her against her inner thoughts. Dropped off outside left to his fate, she had other things to attend to, and so too did her sisters. There was also that small piece of information about how he knew about my want to revenge. This partnership would surely be interesting. So had begun the beginnings of Anakin's empire building plans. The dark side magics and the rituals done to enhance the Dathomirian Zabrak dark sisters and dark brothers was dangerous certainly, and had a minor disadvantage or inconvenience. The influence of the dark side on one's mind and emotions. Just what exactly had been influenced by the ritual and its what were its permanent effects. Anakin's desires despite being more in control because of developed mental control, had to now handle brewing emotions being influenced and increased, that is culminative of his own desires, both from his old life and his new. From what he could identify at least for himself, was emotions related to possessiveness or greed, and another identified as lust. Again primal desires similar to savage operas where he had become transformed into an avatar of rage or wrath and ager, he too has now become similar, but instead of wrath it was more in line with his traits. I knew I was a bit of a playboy, and I wanted to have more than one lover, possibly many, but this is a little intense, and certainly tests my mental practice. Most of my desires though have been repressed due to my physical age, because I have not gone through puberty. I also know I will be going through it again at a faster rate and will start earlier than what my biological age would suggest. The ritual when done on young children and if successful would accelerate growth. At first within the first year one would appear one year older physically, then within the second year, one would appear as if they were two years physically older than your biological age. Finally three years after the ritual one would reach a peak at being physically three years older than what they should be. Anakin while his inner monologuing was going on was moving away towards the exit of the caverns that housed the Night Sisters. The smooth stone created pathways and beautiful glowing water illuminates his path. Using and delving into the energy of the force he is able to tell there is a significant enough change to his ability to utilize the force itself. It feels easier, flows smoother with greater connectivity, and he feels his influence and power to manipulate within the force is much stronger than it was before. Estimating the exact benefits to this increase, he believes it might have increased his midi-chlorian count by a third of what he had been born with. A 33% increase overall. Physically he also feels much more powerful than what he had before, along with measuring his newfound capabilities, it is estimated he should be physically powerful enough and capable to leap a meter off of the ground, without the assistance from the force. Finally reaching the exit, he could see the light of day expanded from just outside. So it is currently daytime. That is good, I think I have been down in the cave for too long. 
I'm much more used to an environment with heat and strong rays of light, but also the extreme cold of the nights on Tatooine. A droid quickly approaches Anakin as it was stationed just outside the entrance to the Dark Sisters Fortress Cavern. Master. A quickly acknowledgement comes from the droid. I want a report of what has happened, but first tell me how long was I within the cavern for? Anakin commanded the droid and asked a question he was curious about. Report, the master was within the caverns for 8 day and night cycles of this planet. So I spent around a total amount of 192 hours within. That means I was unconscious for at least 3 days. They really do not care too much about what had happened to me, or whether I had survived at least they brought me some form of shelter. Furthermore, master the expansion that has been made for your business on Tatooine, and what was meant to be delivered to the Dark Sisters, was already delivered a day ago. The droid furthermore explained. That is good. I do hope they find my payment to be satisfactory. Has what I have also asked about been investigated, of course I do not expect much results, but it would be good if anything was found. No master, only one such planet was located. Should we begin extraction of what is wanted? Well that is unfortunate. That is okay, I will just have to do it myself. What Anakin is referring to is the location of a planet that would play a role into what he wants to do and experiment with in the future. There are two planets he wants to go towards, one such planet contains a special blue stone that would give non-force sensitive individuals to use, in a limited capacity, force abilities. The other planet it seems his droids were able to find was another one he was most interested in. There on that planet a species that was living and sentient, yet were but beings made up of material that was non-organic. Their entire beings and special way their midi-chlorians interact with things was interesting and could be used as least from what he hypothesizes is create life within a mechanical being. He could upgrade all of his droids to be capable of independent thoughts and freedoms, but of course he would still control them and they would be loyal to him. He could also possibly help these droids become even greater, giving them the capacity to use the force themselves. Imagine droids with the non-organic version of midi-chlorians infused into them using those blue stones from the other planet to use force abilities. Then he would not have to worry too much about the droids being incapable as they come learn outside of their initial programming. In no way would he be enslaving the droid as he would be unable to control their actions, but what he could do is bind their loyalty towards him, so they would not betray him. What Anakin didn't know however was that this would lead to a strange development in the future. Tatooine. I had helped fund the uprising. Both furthering my own goals and helping out some other enslaved species along the way is a part of my goals. It helps that all I really needed to do was expend some of the resources I have currently accrued. I won't go into excruciating detail about the war, just that with my hands secretly working behind the scenes of it I had profited. Scraps, even though could be considered trash I had a chance to test out my newly developed droids and weaponry. Other things included the starship my corporation are starting to develop as well. The war he had supported was the uprising of the Amri. After lots of battles with Anakin's assistance, things had moved along accordingly with what would have happened originally, just at a faster pace. The Amri pulled strings with their allies in the Trade Federation to compel the Republic to stop the Kalish's retribution. After several backroom deals the Republic decided to intervene in the conflict, and the Republic Judicial Department dispatched 50 GD under the command of GD Masters Chukadun and Jmar to mediate a settlement. The Amri claimed that the Kalish were the aggressors in the conflict, and corruption ensured that the Galactic Senate pressured the GD to believe them. The GD did as they were told. They chastised the Kalish for their belligerence, ordered them to pay war indemnities, demanded the return of worlds they had conquered, and imposed economic sanctions. Several Kalish leaders faced war trials. Despite the Kalish's protestations that they were the victims, the war finally came to an end with the Yamri victory. Now with the full support of the Republic, the Yamri reclaimed their erstwhile colonies. They destroyed those structures the Kalish had built during their occupation, including burial grounds considered sacred to the reptilians. The Kalish petitioned the Republic and the Trade Federation to put a stop to the desecration, but the Galactic government stood behind the Yamri. The Galactic Republic's response to the Yamri crisis established precedent for the use of paramilitaries by the Galactic government. Supreme Chancellor Finnis Valorum cited the precedent in arguing for a similar response to problems on the planet Ginger. This war can also be referred to the Huck War that included Grievous, born as Kaiman Jaishul. After the war had settled you could say I had offered him a seat on my illustrious droid army, so instead of the droid army he was originally a part of, he became a part of mine. Over the course of two years since her child had seemingly gotten some help from an outside source that he refuses to tell her, she has come to accept her new position. With some effort of course because of her insistent need to reaffirm herself and be kind to others. Shmai was a simple woman who had grown up in slavery, and now as her life improved experiencing luxuries she has only recently grown accustomed to. Despite this there are some things she has a lot of things she would trade up for and do herself to keep her peace of mind, especially since her body has been used to do physical manual labor. Generally she would have to work at first as a maid doing simple chores, but further along the line was elevated to a position, no matter how limited could help her learn new things. In particular technology. 
So it did not come as a surprise that after the inheritance of the business and setting up a junkyard shop, she was easily able to get into the grove of improving upon her limited skills in machinery. It helped that it was a junkyard at least at first, but soon after then top of the line materials were sent enabling her to thrive in and use her time to be a mechanic of sorts. She had become worried about her child despite everything pointing in the direction of him being capable enough to make his own decisions in spite of his age. As Anakin's mother how could she not worry for his well-being? He goes off and explores space or at least that is what she is told, but the first time he had left her, he had come taller, looking different from how she remembered him. He was gone for but a week, no less than two and had changed so much, even if it was only in his height, it was still very telling of something that was wrong. But she had no other way to go about it, but accept the changes and move on, of course her Ani had at least given her some explanation as to what had happened. Logically he was fine, and she had gotten multiple examinations done by their medical droids, if only to put her mind at ease. Other things had happened like the development of their business to the increase of quality in droids. Anakin had be so kind to gift her a personal droid of her own, and he called it C-3PO. A simple translator droid meant to help me with the day-to-day -day business within the shop, as there were a lot of customers of different species with different languages. What she did not know about this protocol droid however was C-3PO was the start of Anakin's experiments with creating living machines, but that would be for another time. She had developed herself over the short few years it had seemed, and had gotten to quite the degree in mastery over programming, mechanics and electronics in general. Obviously she had not achieved the same level of mastery her child had, but she could design and make things well enough. One thing she disliked about their products though were the weaponry, but she knew especially on a planet like Tatooine, that weapons were of more importance over most other things. At least that was how it was at the start. Slowly the weapons transferred over to other things. Harani had come up with the plans and successfully implemented the ideas, selling droids had become the new go-to within the business. The wealth built up had gone into reinvesting into the business that was promptly renamed Skywalker Industries. I could not believe that we had become good enough to become a legalized company within the Republic so far as to have some stores set up within the capital itself. All because of Mayani. If before she had thought of her child as a genius or prodigy, now he may very well be a divine being in human form. Not that she knew of course the nature of his birth, being akin to space Jesus, but she had really begun to believe her child was meant for greater things. The credits she had accumulated had also indirectly gone into reinvesting into Skywalker Industries. She had given freedom to many slaves through simply buying them out, of course the now free individuals could do nothing to prolong their survival despite their freedom. So they had joined as employees for Skywalker Industries. Again indirectly helping the business benefit off of slaves despite them not being slaves. Shmai has limited understanding of this though, things that come to economics and accounting in general, so she left most of that stuff to Anakin, and the specialized droids he created himself. She just helped in the management of said assets. Other weird things were witnessed across the galaxy that she had noted down herself. How worrying. This in turn increased some of their acts against those whom were not human, thinking the wrong done against them was because of that. The political situation on Tatooine was starting to get heated. Talks of some kind of slave uprising. She did not know what to think of that. On one hand it is great that the people wish to rise up and break their chains, but on the other it is incredibly dangerous to go against the current HUD empire. She would help in any way she could, and had been inadvertently doing so as well, by harboring former slaves now freed within their company, many did not want to go against the name they have made for themselves. Shmai was kind, but she was anything but naive and knows all too well that without the army of droids they have, they would be under much more scrutiny. Shmai also knows that criminal activity in the area they stay along with the slaves has become near zero. Again thanks to their company made droids. They had also very recently expanded into the shipbuilding trade, but that would be for another time to think about, because she is currently running a bit late for a meeting. A holographic one, but a meeting nonetheless, she is the standing CEO and owner, so she better get going. Coruscant. Senior Fleet Systems also known as Santer Senior Technologies, has been doing well for the past few years now, but an event took place two years prior, that near took the current CEO's life. Naro Senior was at one point a good CEO, then he had after the attempt on the life of his son, and himself decided to step down from the position. This position was in turn given to his son, not because of simple inheritance, but a combination of that, and that the other members of the company had deemed Wraith Senior to be fit to lead. Of course what most of the board members for Sienner Technologies knew he was the perfect choice not knowing that a given power over to someone from outside the company. That person being the mysterious blackmailer of the father-son duo. Two years ago the father was first approached before the incident that would have originally endangered his own and his son, Wraith's lives. Of course he did not believe at the time at least at first, before the proof of Wraith's crimes were shown to him. No matter what Naro had seen he still loved his son despite his legally grey behavior. Naro easily forgave him, but that did not mean the perpetrators of the attack did. While Wraith had escaped down towards the planet, he had been contacted again with no knowledge as to how he was contacted by the mysterious figure again. He promised to save the life of his son in return for basically selling his own soul to the proverbial devil. 
He readily agreed because of the mental pressure and strain, and quickly handed over his rights to many things, while the call was recorded. He was saved and so too was his son and the rest of the staff that helped navigate and maintain the cruiser Starliner they were on during their vacation-based trip. Naro was shocked to discover the same thing had been done to his son, but instead of offering to save Naro's life, the offer was to his wraiths from his pursuers. For the mysterious figure to know the content of Wraith's character to that degree, certainly spoke volumes of his information network. Scary and terrifying was the being's ability to manipulate not only himself but his son into a situation that cannot be escaped from, at least legally. They had essentially given away most of their assets and handed over the power over these assets, and made them contracted slaves. What was surprising however was that despite this the being never misused his authority over them in the legal sense or any other way. Not that would try to escape the contract given the measures of severity in breaking the terms, or that everything would be handed over, and they themselves would be left with nothing. No this person was way too intelligent in the sense of manipulation, and Naro would think with his discovery of Wraith's espionage skills, he would be able to detect this. Strangely enough he did not. Senior Technologies had actually started to increase in profits once Wraith took control no doubt in part his effort, but it was the backing of the hidden figure that helped the company's progress. Things they had been blocked to do were gone seemingly out of nowhere, and laws they may have impeded us that should not have were not enforced. This truly let them thrive but he knew, making a deal with the devil has its price. Some of that price included unlimited access to their funds and whatever top quality materials that had access to. New supplies were set up between themselves and a new company called Skywalker Industries. It would seem their hidden backer blackmailer was in control of that as well because of its success. It had recently been making a few waves, and he had also put forward some of his own personal funds to invest into it. What had truly gone back and forth was an exchange of sorts when they had been above and on Dantuine, which thankfully led to them making the right decision. The infiltrators had near instantly been identified as soon as he had accepted, and once they had detained them, questioning then again led to the figure being correct, reinforcing the evidence provided. The explosive device was in fact never activated, and despite everything they got out alive. After that communication had been moderately active between Naro, Wraith and the hidden figure. Over the years they, Dathomir had a deep history with many stories revolving a legendary feminine figure that was especially told and passed down through the Dark Sisters, whom are the supposed descendants of such a character. At that time, however, a rogue GD knight named Alia was banished to Dathomir by the GD Council. She took the leadership of the survivors, teaching the ways of the Force to the exiles, and eventually to her own children. In later centuries, Alia was remembered as single-handedly transforming Dathomeri society, credited with enslaving the entire male population under her leadership, turning the rankers from predators to friends, pets, and war mounts, and codifying her teachings in the Book of Law. Some accounts even seem to suppose that she was a lone woman within an otherwise entirely male population, but in reality, these practices may have evolved over several generations, and the parallel with the matriarchal social structure of the rankers may be significant, especially given the symbiosis of the human warrior women and their mounts. Alia's leadership undoubtedly laid the foundations of a unique culture, dominated by force-using women who regarded themselves collectively as her descendants, known to outsiders as the Witches of Dathomir. Over the centuries, the total human population of Dathomir grew to perhaps just over 5,000, based in a relatively narrow coastal area of one of the planet's continents, where more than 90% of the planet remained unexplored. The Dathomiri came to be divided into a number of reasonably permanent local clan communities, which took their names from significant geographical features, such as Singing Mountain, Frenzied River, and Misty Falls. These clans, each just a few hundred strong, accounted for almost the entire planetary population, but there were also small numbers of exiles who lived outside the clan communities, including the planet's dark siders, called Night Sisters, who at times existed in sufficient numbers to form a distinct clan. In total, the clans could probably put at least a thousand warrior women into the field, each of them a trained force user, and many of them riding ranker mounts. Nowadays the warrior women that come from the Dark Sisters has significantly increased, at least the potential number of warrior women have increased. All because of the, the introduction and appearance of the boy known as Anakin Skywalker. The strength of the Dathomiri was discovered by the GD Order in around 310 years prior to now, when the GD Academy ship Yuanthar crashed into a tar pit on Dathomir. At some point, Dathomir appears to have been part of the Republic, and was classed as part of Quelli Sector, but eventually, it fell into the space under the rule of the Drachmarians, which were another matriarchal warrior race, but this time methane-breathing aliens, for whom the planet held little real interest. A few generations ago, a small group of Iridonian Zabrax originating from Ratatak, where their ancestors had crashed in a star cruiser, were brought to Dathomir during pirate raids. When the human Night Sisters discovered that they could interbreed with Zabrax, they isolated them to a small part of the planet where they could draw from them at whim. The Night Sisters also sold some Zabrax and Zabrak human hybrids, and even some of their own, to the Ratataki. Prior to the reign of Talzin, Night Sisters were known to utilize various male castaways for slave labor. Talzin restricted the use of males to the Zabrak Night Brothers. That was among many of the things Talzin had changed, and it was just a start. 
With the aid of their benefactor so to speak, they could change the way they do a lot of things. Of course they like the way their culture has developed and are unwilling to change too much, but many things could be rearranged. So many things did. They had not needed to worry about high death counts anymore, because of their lack of technology or education, elevating their medical knowledge such that could survive. No, they could do much more than simply survive, they could thrive now and they have been throughout the past four years. With their population steadily over the years and their progress in educating their children helped tremendously, but that have been more than that. They had begun to slowly take over the settlements around the planet, no matter how low in resources or population they were. The reason for this was to increase the pull they had on the planet to claiming themselves as the new rulers of the planet, and by having more people the better it is. Of course having a viable military force to back oneself up would help. That is covered by the Dark Sisters themselves specially trained warrior women, and the multiple other people they could train in combat. They also had access to the droids graciously given, and or if they need more were borrowed and supplied by their mysterious and young ally. Tribe after tribe they had been at it, slowly but surely establishing their dominance, and it sure does help once the supplier they had started giving them ships. It was very helpful, and Talzin had considered why the boy continued to help them, and perhaps had taken an interest in the mother than the ritual afforded to him. Of course she was not naive to think the boy did not have any plans for them, it was just a force had helped here with her visions, and she could not see any for him. At least none so directly connected to him, but indirectly she could see how her people would benefit as a whole in the continued relationship with him. For now there has been no signs of the boy leaving them or abandoning them in the near future, considering most of her visions provide her evidence suggesting continued cooperation. Talzin had decided that his cooperation needs to be cemented, set in stone, and she has ideas of how to do this. These ideas of hers may very well break some of the traditions she has kept close at heart and grown up with and has passed down to others, but this would be the exception. She would just have to start increasing communication between both parties and try and set up a meeting, because it would be necessary, but it would also be interesting to see his progress, his growth. Coruscant. It had been a weird and exhausting few years for the GD. Busy had they been with many things but the galaxy at large at least to them was secure, safe and most important of all to them, at peace. This was not 100% true as there had been conflict happening on and off throughout the many years, and they had come into a lull of sorts. Grown complacent in their position of power and secure in the knowledge that the peace within the Republic is continuing, must mean their efforts were not in vain. Well from the position of the GD everything was going just fine, meanwhile there was a Sith Lord and his apprentice right under their noses. The GD Council had gotten a new member just last year, Coyote Mundi. Yes the ever small group of masters that sit upon the GD High Council, where only the best of the best, most powerful within the Force and talented, ever get to reach. The members of the GD Order had many positions within its metaphorical walls, but the most prestigious and sought after would be the High Council. Despite this position there are not many qualified to reach this level. One such person whom had been qualified to join the High Council, went by the name of Qui-Gon Jinn. A force-sensitive human male, was a venerable if maverick GD master. Wise and well-respected member of the GD Order, and was offered a seat on the GD Council, but chose to reject and follow his own path. Adhering to a philosophy centered around the living force, Jin strove to follow the will of the force, even when his actions conflicted with the wishes of the High Council. Born on the core world Coruscant, the capital of the Galactic Republic 48 years prior, Jin eventually learned the ways of the force, as the Padawan of GD Master Dooku, before ultimately attaining the rank of GD Knight. He would go on to take an apprentice of his own, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who adhered to the principles of the GD Code, more than his own master. Although their relationship was sometimes tough, the two GD overcame early difficulties during a mission to Pigil, which concluded in Jin, turning down a request to join the GD Council to continue teaching his apprentice. Qui-Gon and his apprentice Obi-Wan had recently been ordered to meet with the GD High Council for something important. A meeting was to take place about an urgent matter, that matter being blockade created by the Trade Federation around the peaceful planet of Naboo. The galaxy at large was first exposed to the planet Naboo in the backwater Chamel sector, around 29 years ago, when subtext mining discovered rich veins of plasma. Members of subtext mining were hired by the King Bone Tapalo's opposition to conduct surveys. Sith Lord Darth Plagueis, in his guise of Hago Damask of Damask Holdings, visited the world to discuss mining rights. He visited with disgruntled members of the nobility, including Ars Varuna. Plagueis was able to negotiate with the Naboo to expand their spaceport facilities and build a processing facility on the Salu River. Outer rim construction and assembly was contracted to build the facility. As part of the deal, Plagueis agreed to finance Tapolo's election to the throne. Damask's support of Tapolo led to the Nubian's election as king, and an opening of Naboo to interplanetary trade. King Tapolo and his chief advisors, led by Ars Varuna, succeeded in negotiating a contract with the Trade Federation to ship out the plasma from Naboo and sell it to other planets along the Hydean Way. The deal with the Trade Federation allowed a great period of economic prosperity to settle on the mid-rim world, but the Naboo quickly begun to grow dissatisfied with the result. 
While they sold their plasma to the Trade Federation for fixed prices, the latter could sell the plasma at inflated prices on the open market, reaping much larger profits than the NABU. As a result, a great deal of resentment against the Trade Federation developed on NABU, specifically amongst the royals who had opposed Tapolo's election to the throne, led by Senator Vider Kim. Secretly, Tapolo and his advisors had made a profit themselves for agreeing to the deal with the Trade Federation. Varuna, upon his election as King of Nabu after Tapolo's term had ended, became intent on forcing a confrontation with the Trade Federation over control of Nabu's plasma resources. As such, he created a core of Nubian design collective starfighters. He also planned to have the Trade Federation's part in the transport of plasma from Nabu taken over by the Huts, namely his ally, Gardala Basati, whose transports would move the plasma from Nabu to its client worlds, under the protection of Black Sun and the Bando Gora. The move was opposed by Nabu Senator Palpatine, who later split with Varuna, and convinced a young Padma Amidala, the popular governor of Thiet, to run against the king in the following election. Amidala's platform concentrated on a renegotiation of the original contract with the Trade Federation, while Varuna planned a more militaristic approach. Eventually, Varuna was forced to abdicate, and Amidala won the throne by landslide. In secret, Plagueis and his apprentice, Darth Sidious, the Sith identity of Senator Palpatine, had manipulated events to cause a crisis between the Trade Federation and its client worlds. With Nabu seeking to renegotiate its contract with the Trade Federation, they had what they needed to throw the Republic into chaos. Just as they had secretly replaced Varuna by engineering Amidala's election, they placed their puppet, Trade Federation Viceroy Newt Gunray, as the overall leader of the conglomerate, by having the Trade Federation Directorate killed during the Iriadu Trade Summit. So close. So close to when everything is to begin and spiral out of control. Anakin thinks over the events to happen in the near future. My planning and the practice I have put into my Force-related abilities should be enough, so that by the time I want the things I want, everything would go smoothly. Coruscant. An ever-expanding trading alliance, the Trade Federation, headed by the Nemoidian Viceroy Newt Gunray, would purchase victories in the Galactic Senate with their immense resources. As an independent entity, they even had their own senator, Lot Dodd, and went so far as to persuade the weapons inspectors of the Galactic Republic to ignore the arming of their one-time cargo craft. Secretly, the Federation had converted these shipment vessels into lethal battleships. The modifications were made ostensibly to defend against increasing pirate activity in the Outer Rim territories. Following the build-up, the battleships and battle droids largely replaced the Trade Defense Force and its Marine Forces. Gunray was granted a permanent seat on the Trade Federation Directorate, following the acquisition of exclusive shipping rights of La Might Or from the planet Dorvala one year ago. An invasion force of deadly battle droid soldiers was built in addition to the increasing number of the Federation's disguised warships by Bactoid Armor Workshop and Higher Chol Engineering on schedule, but at the cost of an exorbitant amount of credits. They were part of a plot quietly masterminded by Darth Sidious, as part of his scheme to establish himself, beneath his public persona of Senator Palpatine, as Supreme Chancellor. Sidious had approached the Federation's Viceroy Newt Gunray, and suggested a test for the new army. Gunray suggested Iriadu, but Sidious countered by suggesting the home of Senator Palpatine, a world which would not respond with force. Later, Sidious contacted them and ordered a fleet assembled. Deputy Viceroy Hathmauncher left the flagship Sokak in a scout ship and took a Sith holocron with information about the impending blockade. Sidious's apprentice, Darth Maul, was tasked with recovering the holocron, which he eventually took from the Coruscant information broker Lorne Pavan. During the hunt for the holocron, Maul engaged and killed the Jedi Anun Bandara and his Padawan Darsha Ascent, ensuring the secrecy of the return of the Sith. Kenobi investigated their deaths and suspected Black Sun involvement. When Kenobi returned to the Jedi Temple, he discovered that he and his master had been assigned as ambassadors to the blockade. One year prior, the Federation's opponents in the Galactic Senate were pressing Valorum to slow the trade organization. The Supreme Chancellor responded by calling for the disbandment of the free trade zones, albeit granting additional defensive allowances. Following the Iriadu incident, the Republic soon passed legislation calling for the taxation of trade routes to outlying star systems. The reason for this was twofold, it would serve to weaken the growing Federation, and would recoup funds for the ailing Republic. Unfortunately for the Republic, the Trade Federation felt offended, and was determined to strike back. The Federation also pursued alliances with the Intergalactic Banking Clan, Corporate Alliance, and Techno Union, groups which were also affected by increased taxation. GD Council member Adi Gallia monitored the actions of the Trade Federation following the summit, and it was her who alerted the GD Council to suspicious activities in the NABU system. NABU. Padma Berry of Nabu, publicly known by her renal name, Padma Amidala, and also known as Her Royal Highness, Queen Amidala of Nabu since a year ago, or more commonly known as the third year after the Great Tree Cinch, was the younger daughter of Rowi and Jobal Naberi, and the sister of Sola Naberi. Padma grew up in an isolated mountain village where her parents instilled in their children high virtues like self-sacrifice and care for the socially weak. Her family moved to Thede when she was young, and Padma attended the best schools available to her, enjoying occasional class retreats to Nabu's lake country. 
In her youth, she volunteered for the refugee relief movement, like her father had before her, and journeyed to Shadabai Boran to aid in the relocation efforts of the natives. Sadly, many of these refugees died when they were unable to adapt to life on another world. Following this, she entered the legislative youth program, where she met a young man named Palo. A brief innocent relationship followed, but the pair parted ways when Palo became an artist, and Padden continued in politics. She never forgot her past or her heritage, however, even after she reached the top, Amidala still maintained her village's tradition of painting her thumbnail on each hand stark white, a small but notable sign of her dedication to her family. Amidala's rise was meteoric. She had joined the apprentice legislature at age 8 and became a full apprentice legislator by age 11. During this time, she first met Celia Chesson, her workshop mentor. One year ago, at the age of 13, Padna Berry had become Princess of Thede and was extremely popular, rallying those opposed to the rule of King Ars Varuna. She became involved in a relationship with Ian Lego, the young son of Varuna's prime counselor, Kun Lego. Lego's father opposed the match, but it ended of its own accord when Varuna abdicated and Amidala accepted to enter the race to succeed the king. Her bid for the throne had initially been suggested to her parents and subsequently discreetly backed by Senator Palpatine, who wished to see Varuna lose the election for his own reasons. Although prodigiously talented, Amidala, at 14 years old, was still not the youngest queen of Nabu to ever be elected. Once elected queen, Patton took the name Amidala and amended the constitution to limit the rule of elected monarchs to two terms, in light of Varuna's unpopular long rule. Her birth name was Padna Berry, Amidala was actually a renal name. In her guise as Queen Amidala, she appeared regal and austere, but as Padden, she was headstrong and compassionate. It appeared that her birth name was not public knowledge. In a lengthy communique assembled by Supreme Chancellor Valorum's aide in the current age, the Republic diplomats and intelligence officers who contributed listed Padm as one of the Queen's handmaidens and only referred to the Queen as Amidala. The notion that the handmaiden's true purpose was to serve as the Queen's decoys, suggested by a Senate security officer based on irregularities in the Royal Starship's passenger lists, was dismissed as outrageous. Amidala's cadre of handmaidens, young women of a similar age and with a striking similarity to her, acted as bodyguards, decoys, and confidants to their mistress, roles devised by Amidala's head of security, Captain Panaka, who insisted the new queen be trained in self-defense and weapons usage. While Amidala was queen, her handmaidens included Sabe, Irdi, Rabe, Yane and Satch. Thrust into a position of authority and power, Padma had to prove herself or at least she felt like she had to. With great power comes great responsibility or so she has learned. Living on this planet that she had come to know as her home, she had many things she wanted to do. Many things she wanted to change, but it seems during her tenure she would be coming across many problems. Including the predicament she is in right now. A blockade conducted by the Trade Federation had started, and she had minimal information about how to go about a situation like this. She had many experiences in her very short lifespan, but now similar in nature to what is happening now. I do suppose this is a diplomatic-based event, but how could my planet, my people be ready to face such a threat? To understand her thoughts one only need to look at Nabu's military. It has been traditional that the established peaceful nature of the people of Nabu did not do anything that contradicted their way of life. So having a military capable enough to defend their own planet was a shortcoming. With no force strong enough in either quantity or quality that could not engage in and be combative about the situation. Of course she has her own personal guards so as to protect her from harm and she herself had been trained in the event she were in dire need of protection. Most other queens that had succeeded the throne she sits on now would not have been able to survive without some level of training. They had not required or needed an army to defend themselves for a long time now, and this has made the people somewhat complacent in their place within the galaxy. With protection provided to them from the Senate, at least the aid that should have been given they would be safe. About five months after her election and one year ago, she had been faced with what would become one of the most significant problems in Nabu history. In protest of the Galactic Senate's decision to tax users of the galaxy's trade routes, Viceroy Newt Gunray of the Trade Federation enforced a blockade on Amidala's homeworld, Nabu. With few resources of its own, Nabu relied on imports, and the blockade served as the perfect example of the Republic's reliance on trade. Amidala tried to use diplomatic and political means to rid her planet of the Trade Federation, yet it was all in vain. The Viceroy, secretly following the orders of Darth Sidious, avoided direct diplomatic efforts. Not that Pad knew this, but what she did know was if she did not receive any type of help soon she would be in huge trouble, and so too will the rest of her people. Her desire, her drive and ambition to do things great, king and so much more, but she had to inherit this problem. From what she knows ambassadors from the Republic are being sent her way. She had sent for help discreetly, she would receive some help discreetly through Chancellor Valorum, and she has no clue as to whom they may be. Coruscant. Darth Sidious, also known as Chancellor Palpatine, the insidious mastermind behind the blockade of Nabu had many plans. Many, many plans that had gone oh so right. He had finally done it. Rid himself of his detestable master with which he had no more to learn from. At least that was what Sidious told himself to keep his sanity. 
His benevolent master did not pass down all of his knowledge, his teachings despite being his apprentice, all because of his obsession with eternal life. Killed him in his sleep. No mercy just like he had been taught, that left him freedom, true freedom like nothing ever before, and it was one the sweetest of things he would ever taste. He would savor it, but he had more to do, more of his ambitions to continue with. His overwhelming desire to create his very own empire. He would be at the top controlling everything, everyone and he would absolutely dominate it all. Unfortunately he would not be able to enjoy his empire without a young body, as with his younger body, he could truly get into the joys of life. Not that he already does not. Back to his plans, one of his many plans where he manipulates and takes advantage of as many people as available for his considerations to work. One of his main plans, the blockade done on Nabu by the Trade Federation. Orchestrated by his hand. Sidious, as Palpatine, moved to seize power from Supreme Chancellor Finnis Valorum, who had virtually no political power and counted Palpatine as a close friend and ally, allowing for Sidious to easily manipulate him. In need of pawns for his plans, but preferring a mysterious hooded presence through holographic transmissions rather than direct communication, Sidious contacted the galaxy's most powerful beings and convinced them to do his bidding with promises and threats. To that end, Sidious was also able to manipulate Newt Gunray's rise to the position of Viceroy of the Trade Federation, and convinced the Trade Federation to obey him by promising wealth. Ordering the Federation to construct a droid army, Sidious also helped the Geonosian Poggle the Lesser rise to the position of Archduke of Geonosis and controller of their droid foundries. With Sidious's backing, Poggle produced millions of B-1 series battle droids for the Trade Federation military. This helped further his plans, and through holographic communication, Sidious conspired with Viceroy Gunray to blockade the planet Nabu, in protest of the Senate's taxation of trade routes to outlying star systems. Sidious had secretly been behind the Senate bills around taxation, including the voting sessions that ended in Federation defeats and victories, while Gunray falsely believed Sidious was working towards Federation victories all the time. The Trade Federation initiated the invasion of Nabu on the orders of Sidious, who also instructed Gunray to kill Chancellor Valorum's GD ambassadors. When Gunray questioned the legality of the invasion, Sidious simply stated that he would make it legal. That is right, ambassadors that he became aware of that he wanted to put a stop to, because they would most likely ruin his plan. Turmoil has engulfed the Galactic Republic. The taxation of trade routes to outlying star systems is in dispute. Hoping to resolve the matter with a blockade of deadly battleships, the Greedy Trade Federation has stopped all shipping to the small planet of Nabu. While the Congress of the Republic endlessly debates this alarming chain of events, the Supreme Chancellor has secretly dispatched two GD Knights, the Guardians of Peace and Justice in the Galaxy, to settle the conflict Grievous, born as Kaiman Jai Shilal, was the cyborg supreme commander of the droid army of the Confederacy of Independent Systems in another timeline, another universe. Grievous was originally a Kalish from the planet Kali, where he lived his early life. During the Kalish conflict against the Huk, Kaiman Jai Shilal quickly learned the art of war, specializing in a slugthrower rifle. Quickly amassing a great number of Huck kills, he became a demigod among his people. He eventually met the female Kalish Rondera Lijkummer, a master with the sword. The two became very close before Kummer's death at the hands of the Huck. Heartbroken, Kaiman Jai Shilal renamed himself Grievous and turned all his anger and grief toward the Huck. Aided by his elite, he forced the Huck off Kali and then swarmed their homeworld, conquering them. The Huck turned to the Galactic Republic for help, and the Kalish were forced back to their own world by the Jedi and left to starve. Grievous did not do all of this without some aid helping him within the background though. The body he had meet with all those years ago had him joining the boy's cause. Unfortunately even with the aid of his new leader he had been defeated, and so too his people along with him, despite his legendary status and capabilities. Help him he did, reforming his body anew with some top-of-the-line mechanical parts enhanced and created by his now leader, Anakin. Grievous was told that he had come to help him and bring him into his fold, his army he would be amassing to free people of slavery. Grievous himself was not against the idea of saving some helpless souls, and when it had been revealed to him the scale of this operation and what he would be lead into, he became excited. Being left to help train the droids as they seemed to be alive. As if they were truly aware of their surroundings, of their leader and his goals, wants and desires. Grievous would be lying to himself if he said he did not fear the boy. Grievous himself was bored and craved for some action, but it would not come for him, at least not yet, but he could entertain himself with the sentient droids. Fortunately there were only a few, and not all of the army was like this. Grievous had heard Anakin say resources were limited, and he could only grant life to a select few elite droids. Then I will plead our case to the Senate. The Queen replies while following the GD out into the open space of the hangar bay, simultaneously saying to her counselor. Be careful governor. Back within the hangar, everyone advances towards the droids encircling the pilots held captive. The captain of the guard says whilst pointing in the direction of the cluster of droids and people. We will need to free those pilots. I will deal with that. Obi-Wan replies as he nudges the captain's gun downwards. Qui-Gon continues in another direction approaching the commanding droid. Halt. Comes the synthesized voice of the droid. I am ambassador to the Supreme Chancellor, and I am taking these people to Coruscant. Qui-Gon replies. 
and turn the droid questions. Where are you taking them? To Coruscant. The droid stutters a bit. Coruscant. That doesn't compute. The droid then points a mechanical finer towards Qui-Gon and exclaims. Wait, you're under arrest. With no other words exchanged, Qui-Gon ignites his lightsaber in a flash and engages the droid splitting it in half before getting to work on the others. Obi-Wan is also quickly dispatching the rest of the droids, holding the pilots captive, with the droid barely able to fire some shots off. Other droids start firing at the group as they board the spacecraft. Qui-Gon reflects the shots fired in defense of the others, and after Obi-Wan has finished off the droids around the pilots, the pilots hastily get up and escape. Most of the pilots head for the same ship the others boarded while others head for their own ships. Everyone manages to get aboard including the two GD and their companion Jar Jar. Now stay here and keep out of trouble. Obi-Wan says to the lone Jar Jar as he leaves him with some astromech. Hello, boyos. Jar Jar greets the astromech. Within the pilot's area Qui-Gon rushes inside to see the current pilot and the captain of the guard. They zoom past the atmosphere of the planet easily with barely any resistance, but they have yet to pass their greatest obstacle. There is the blockade. Says the pilot as everyone within the room stares out into space where a fleet is them surrounded. One of the ships starts to fire in their direction, and a shot unfortunately is able to land damaging their ship. Shield generator's been hit. The pilot exclaimed. The astromechs within their parking area activated as soon as the alarm was heard. Multiple of them quickly made their way to the deploy shaft to do their jobs. On top of the ship the droids hard at work are going as fast as they can to repair the damage. The astromech droids were being destroyed one by one and not in a slow manner, but very fast and Obi-Wan could see that. We are losing droids. Fast. If we can't get the shield generator fixed we will be sitting ducks. The guard captain says. Another explosion is heard on top, and with only one droid remaining to repair the ship, this puts them into a desperate situation. The shields are gone. The pilot says. The silver and blue pattern droid gets to work, re-establishes and repairs the broken shield generators successfully. The pilot is surprised. The power's back. That little droid did it. It bypassed a main power drive. The fleet continues to fire upon them. Deflector shields up at maximum. It's a success. They escape the blockade, but a problem has been brought up by the pilot. There is not enough power to get us to Coruscant. The hyperdrive is leaking. We will have to land somewhere to fuel and repair the ship. Qui-Gon says to everyone, awaiting ideas. Here master, Tatooine, it's small, out of the way but the Trade Federation has no presence there. Obi-Wan directs to his master. How can you be sure? The guard captain questions. It's controlled by the huts. Quingon replies. You can't take her royal highness there, the huts are gangsters. If they discovered her the guard captain says in concern. It would be no different if we landed on a system controlled by the Federation. Except that the huts aren't looking for her, which gives us the advantage. Qui-Gon interjects. Within another room of the cruiser everyone has gotten aboard in. The queen sits upon a chair within the back center of the room, while Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, the captain guard and the astromech droid that survived were present. An extremely well put together little droid your highness. Without a doubt it saved the ship as well as out lives. The captain guard speaks to his queen. It is to be commended. What is its number? The queen asks. Taking a quick glance at the astromech droid's number before replying, the guard captain then says. R2-D2 your highness. Thank you R2-D2. The queen thanks the droid, while R2-D2 replies in a series of synthesized beeps and humming sounds indicating its response. The queen continues. Padden. One of the queen's handmaidens, identified by her name Padden, steps forward from behind the queen. Clean this droid up as best you can. It deserves our gratitude. The queen tells her handmaiden. Continue captain. The captain turns towards Qui-Gon expecting him to speak up about their current problem. Qui-Gon then steps forward. Your highness, with your permission we are heading for a remote planet called Tatooine. It is in a system far beyond the reach from the Trade Federation. I do not agree with the GD on this. The captain disagrees with the GD's decision because of the potential danger against his queen. You must trust my judgment on this. Qui-Gon insists. Within another room, Padden the handmaiden to the queen, diligently cleaned the astromech droid that had helped save all of their lives, is disturbed by an intruder, and introduced to the Gungan named Jar Jar. That's it, Tatooine. The captain informs everyone within the cockpit nearing the scorching planet of Tatooine. There is a settlement. Obi-Wan comments. And near the outskirts. We don't want to attract attention. Qui-Gon continues. Their pilot take them to the outskirts of the settlement they have located, the cruiser finally landing on what could be their salvation. As they land the cruiser's landing gear comes out. Within the ship Qui-Gon enters the same room as Obi-Wan is in while dressed up in a different outfit. One that is distinctly gray. The hyperdrive generator is gone master, we will need a new one. Obi-Wan directed towards his master. That will complicate things. Be weary, I sense a disturbance in the force. Qui-Gon says. I feel it also master. Don't let them send any transmissions. Qui-Gon, R2-D2 along with Jar Jar head off into the settlement. The sun doing murder to Mesa's skin. 
Jar Jar complains. Wait. Qui-Gon and Jar Jar turn around to face the voice that called out to them. Wait. Turning around they identify the person whom had called out to them as the guard captain, and alongside him is another person. Her Highness commands you to take her handmaiden with you. The captain continues as he meets up with them. No more commands from Her Highness today captain. The spaceport is not going to be pleasant. Qui-Gon replies. The queen wishes it. She is curious about the planet. The captain emphasizes. Qui-Gon sighs as he thinks it over. This is not a good idea. Stay close to me. The handmaiden pad joins the two and R2-D2 to explore the spaceport. After a short walk under the grueling twin sons of Tatooine, they make their way into the settlement. Moisture farms for the most part. Some indigenous tribes and scavengers and a few spaceports like this one are havens for those who don't wish to be found. Qui-Gon directs his explanation to Padm. Padm responds. Like us. This is very very bad. Jar Jar comments while stepping in some dung. There are many people of various races spread throughout the area most traveling in groups. Qui-Gon's group travels further into the spaceport. Looking around Qui-Gon vocalizes his thoughts. We can try one of the smaller dealers. Qui-Gon walks into the direction of a small shop with the name emblazoned just outside. Skywalker Technologies was engraved on the outside of the shop. Qui-Gon tries to remember something at the back of his mind, but can't seem to place it when seeing the word Skywalker. Well, let's try first. Within a secluded workshop, a boy that looks like a teen is working on various bits and pieces, reconstructing a droid to make it better in some capacity. This young man is 1.5 meters tall and has sandy blonde hair with bright blue eyes. This teen is Anakin. I had been planning for a while now and had gotten the required things necessary to start a relationship with Qui-Gon Jinn when he undoubtedly comes to this very same shop. I did not do much to upgrade the exterior, knowing full well the reason he originally entered Watto's junkyard was because he would try smaller dealers first. Of course I could have changed it to make it look more extravagant, and he may have in the end come to a bigger dealer if he knew the Skywalker name, but I was not willing to take the risk of not being able to become a Jedi. All that knowledge is there for me to take, how could I leave it? So I had restocked on the supplies I know the group coming here would need, and would semi-manipulate the events to go similarly to how it might have gone. This is so my knowledge of what is to happen in the future is not tainted. But I do know that is unlikely to matter, and everything should have changed a lot without my influence. I may very well be the icing on the cake. Another reason is because I could not help but be excited at the prospect of meeting an important character, Patton. So I restricted myself a bit in my actions to ensure I get to meet her. It won't go the same considering my now different look form how I should appear, but that is only better for me. For now though, I had gotten my mother to stand in at the front of the shop to greet these customers in specific because she would be taking Watto's place instead. I would soon make my appearance, but I currently have other things I would be working at, at that time. The Padresses. Podrissing was a dangerous racing sport performed by repulsor crafts known as podrissers, which were small one-man craft propelled by large engines. Popular on planets such as Malister, Kurgans, Theron, Cantonica, and Tatooine, individuals who competed in these games were also known as podrissers. I planned to show off a bit of my skill and would have to try act a way similar to my age, but not similar enough that it would be a turn-off for Pad. But from what I know she did find the original cute, especially when he said the cheesy pickup line. So it shouldn't be too hard for me to persuade her for various purposes, and one of those purposes is to propose some sort of agreement with the Nabu. I would like to try and slowly take over that planet as well and make it a part of my future empire of sorts. I have grown ambitions outside of continuously growing in power, physically, mentally and spiritually within the force. Growth is a part of the process, but desiring to achieve something should be a part of my goals. Right now I am working towards freeing my people, in a sense. Freeing the slaves of Tatooine and controlling the planet, and I am not too far off from achieving this goal. Only within a few more years would I be able to accomplish this. The problem is where do I go from there? And what greater direction than taking over and developing a lot of planets that are abandoned or otherwise incapable of growth due to economics, geographics, lack of population or not enough militaristic might to overcome a lot of problems. So that is what I would do, not become some sort of savior, but I doubt I would not be seen this way, but a sort of pioneer for a greater future for myself and those around me. Sounds reasonable enough for me, and it starts with declaring myself the sole sovereign of Tatooine. Within the shop known by the locals as Skywalker Technologies the GD Qui-Gon Jinn and his companions, Jar Jar Binks, Padden the Handmaiden and R2-D2 walk into the store and are greeted with the sight of a beautiful woman sitting behind a desk working on some type of mechanoid. A chime rings in the background alerting the woman of their presence, and she begins to speak in Galactic Basic. Hello, welcome to Skywalker's Technologies. How may I help you? She asks politely. Qui-Gon gets straight to the point. I need parts for a J-Type 327 Nubian. Nubian? Well if you would let me check I would be able to tell you if we have any available. The woman in reply says then directs her voice elsewhere. Honey? Please come here, we have a customer. 
The others start to look around the clean and tidy shop, noticing the various mechanical bits and pieces from droid parts to weaponry, even fully constructed droids ready to to purchased and activated. My droid had a readout of what I need. Qui-Gon continues. Within a few seconds a teen human boy appears from around the inner outside of the store. He is of around 1.5 meters in height with a very strong looking physique, and the others are a bit stunned by his appearance. From his eyes being blue in color and his hair being an ethereal sandy blonde. He looks like he could be a model of some kind, given his beautiful appearance not taking into account his movement and the way he carries himself. Most of the group are stunned none more so than Padm with Qui-Gon stunned just behind her, but for other reasons. Ani would you be a dear and watch over the store for me? The beautiful woman asks the teen. Sure mother. The boy whose name or nickname is identified as Ani replies. Why did I not get any droids to do this instead? Well, hindsight is 2020. Anakin thinks to himself. Anakin looks over the group before taking a seat at the entrance of the storefront behind the very same desk his mother was behind. Please come this way. Anakin's mother directs. Before Jar Jar could touch anything Anakin speaks out loud so the Gungan could hear him. I suggest you do not touch anything over there. You do not want to get shot right? We have multiple security measures in place to stop stuff like theft from happening, and you are about to do would be considered as theft. Qui-Gon was just about to reprimand Jar Jar, but he beaten to the punch, while Padm still distracted, continuously stares at Anakin. Qui-Gon along with R2-D2 follow the woman out back, while Jar Jar and Padm stay with the teenage-looking Anakin. Should I say the line? Padm is staring rather intensely at me, she is not subtly at all. Anakin thinks to himself. It would be a bit embarrassing to say it. Anakin is currently looking away from Padm focusing on something else, whereas Padm takes full advantage and stares, thinking she has not been noticed yet. You know with you staring at me like that one would start to wonder. Anakin says directing his voice towards Padm. Padm blushes a bit either because of the heat or something else before recompassing herself. Oh, sorry I was impolite. Hello, my name is Padm. Of course her training did help her in this situation to avoid any awkwardness. Hello Padm, my name is Anakin Skywalker. Skywalker, like the Skywalker on the outside of the shop? Wait I think I have also seen that name in other places as well Pad recognizes the name, but cannot seem to place it other than the connection between the young man and the current store's brand name. So what are you guys here for? Anakin questioned Pad knowing full well the answer. Well we are here to get some repairs done for our ship, and we thought we would try a small shop first. Pad answered. Smaller shop? Do you not know that this shop you have entered isn't considered a part of a small company? The name Skywalker must not ring any bells. Anakin says in a questioning tone. No, I do know or recognize the name which also happens to be your last name, I just can't place where I have heard of it. Padm admits. Well, you are standing in the original shop that started the Skywalker Industries brand. Skywalker Industries? The Skywalker Industries. No wonder I recognize the name. You guys make weapons and droids, very recently adding in starships to your products. I have to say I dislike the corporation you are a part of. Padm passionately says. Because we help people in wars? Or that the droids and weapons we produce can be used in a violent way? These things can be used in more than an aggressive way they could also be used in defense, but I must admit weapons can be used for activities you dislike. Anakin explains. The Nabu are a peaceful people, but I do understand the use of weapons in self-defense. Padm states. Anakin asks. You do, do you? In the background the even clumsy Jar Jar starts to mess around with a small droid which results in a small scuffle between the two. Hit it on its nose. Anakin tells Jar Jar. Wait didn't this originally happen? We met back up with Shmai and Qui-Gon going through the back storage area. A Nubian hyperdrive generator? We seem to have some parts around, but I am unsure if there is any with us here, and I am also sure that no one else has the generator you're looking for here on Tatooine. Shmai tells Qui-Gon as they walk through the storage within the back. You might as well buy a new ship because the cost for a new generator of a ship of that model will cost you. That does remind me, how are you going to pay? Shmai continues. I have 20,000 Republic Datteries. Republic Credits? Republic credits are not taken out here, and the credits you give me now will be of no use within a short time frame. It is better if you have something else because I can't accept credits for this store in particular. Shmai denies. That is unfortunate. I do not have anything else, but credits will do fine. Qui-Gon tries to use a GD mind trick, but for some reason it does not work. What? Is she force sensitive? I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but I cannot take the credits. Shmai insists. Again gesturing with his hands Qui-Gon tries again. Credits will do fine. Shmai insists yet again. I insist that the credits you are offering are useless to me right now. I simply have no need for it. Getting a little upset Shmai responds again. I don't not know what you are up to, but if you do not have a method to pay, then I suggest you either leave or take your credits elsewhere. Maybe you might be lucky enough to find someone else with the part you need, but I doubt it. Shmai has had a fair share of unruly customers and those who would not pay. From being short some to having the wrong type of money she would or even could accept, she had gained an attitude suited to a businesswoman. 
Qui-Gon looks down for a bit before recompassing himself before facing Shmai and giving a small smile and head nod before turning around with R2-D2 following him to the entrance. Anakin and Pad were continuing their conversation while Jar Jar was messing around. We are leaving. Qui-Gon directs to Pad as she sees him walk in. Jar Jar. He also says to Jar Jar whom is messing around while swiftly walking towards the door that doubles as the entrance and exit from the store. I am glad to have met you Anakin. Padm follows after Qui-Gon with a smile on her face. Anakin responds as she is leaving. I guess I was too. Jar Jar follows behind R2-D2, whom follows behind Padm as they all leave. Anakin's mother walks from the outside towards her child. Ani, they seemed a bit lost on what to do. I do not want them back here because of that man whom tried to intimidate me. Did he? Anakin asks. He did not have the right money we use here, and you know we don't accept Republic credits here on Tatooine, even if we could use it back on Coruscant. Right here it is useless. Despite her kind nature her few years working within a business that is surrounded in an area by known criminals, she would gain an edge to her character. I am sure that they come up with a solution. I think we should finish up here then head home. I am sure C-3PO can handle things here for a while, we can take a break. Anakin offers. Okay if that is what you want communicating back with the ship Qui-Gon calls into the pilot's cabin. Obi-Wan responds to his call. And you're sure there is nothing left on board? Qui-Gon says in a questioning tone. A few containers of supplies. The Queen's wardrobe maybe but not enough for you to barter with. Not in the amount you are talking about. Obi-Wan replies. Alright I am sure another solution will present itself. I will check back later. Qui-Gon disconnects from the device and puts it away and is about to head off into the streets again. Before they could head off again Jar Jar decides to voice his thoughts. No again, no again. These whereabouts are quasi. Jar Jar gestures with his hands near his head doing circles. We shall be robed and crunched. Not likely we have nothing of value. That's our problem. Qui-Gon quips. The group once again sets off into the streets of Mos Espa. While doing so the group passes a food stand with various alien grub up for sale, and Jar Jar being the clumsy Gungan he is decides to do something stupid. Jar Jar proceeds to extend and grab onto the hanging food and eat it. Doing so grabs the attention of the shop owner whom questions if he is to pay for it, thus surprising Jar Jar leading to the following events. Jar Jar lets go, and the meat gets launched in the direction of another person, landing perfectly into that being's food. Jar Jar tries to play off the situation, but is unsuccessful the being rushes up from his table, dashing towards Jar Jar on its two hands, and confronts the Gungan. Alerted to the lack of Jar Jar's presence behind him, Qui-Gon turns around to witness the event taking place. Before any more harm befalls Jar Jar, Anakin happens to be nearby and approaches the two where one is ready to fight the other. Careful, Sebulba. You know of my sway and power around these parts. It would be best if you just back off now. Anakin speaks in another language directed at the Doug. The now identified Sebulba backs away from the two, Anakin and Jar Jar with some trepidation within his eyes, not wanting to start a confrontation with Anakin. Sebulba even though afraid, decides to get some insults out to cover for his fear. If you weren't protected by the huts I would and had your own droids I would have squashed you now. Sebulba says not knowing Anakin at this point could fully defend himself from doing basic training, along with his developed force abilities. Still continuing in the alien language Anakin has the last words. It would be a problem if you tried something otherwise. Qui-Gon walks over towards Anakin and Jar Jar who is still sitting on the ground. Hello. Anakin greets. Hi there. Qui-Gon responds. Your friend here was about to be turned into orange goo. He picked a fight with a Doug, an especially dangerous Doug called Sebulpa. Anakin explains while Qui-Gon helps the pathetic Gungan up. Mesa hating crunching. That's the last thing Mesa want. Jar Jar tries to explain. Nevertheless the boy is right you're heading into trouble. Thanks my young friend. Qui-Gon states. Actually I look much older than what age I actually am. Anakin tries to clear up any misunderstanding knowing that the younger he is, the easier it would be to convince Qui-Gon to help him get into the Jedi Order. And what would that be? Padm asks, curious to know the answer considering he looks to be the near the same age as herself. The group starts to walk off into the streets again, with Anakin deciding to tag along with the bunch. Anakin starts to think to himself just after the group had left the store, and soon after he had sent his mother after them to return home while he stays back for a bit. I did sense Qui-Gon try to use the same GD mind trick on my mother. Too bad for him I have found a way to protect her from outside psychic influences, through the use of copying Watto's natural mental shields. Technically the natural shields that Tadarian possess are a part of their biological makeup, but not only this, it is also the way their midichlorians react to the presence of outside influence. It creates a shield-like ability even for someone with a limited amount of midichlorians, this ability is strong enough to resist such force abilities or even psychic ones. There are other protections in place to protect her physically, but the mind is what I consider more important, if only by a fraction of importance because of sensitive information. 
Her mind does not have defenses or enough capabilities in on herself to shield her, but manipulating her midi-chlorians to recreate the effect was simple enough. It was hard trying to find a way to naturally make her own midi-chlorians create this limited defense, but it was worth it, so now she wouldn't be used against me at least through mind control. I do recognize though there are many ways around this. My very own mental abilities can cloak my presence within the force, meaning the midi-chlorians within another, will not be able to actively sense it giving me the ability to read someone's surface thoughts and emotions. I did experience a spike of anger, knowing he had tried the same trick despite my mother being much more polite than what Watto would have been. But it is par for the course that GD would use that ability, and he would at least have tried to compensate her with a lot of credits. It was quite funny to me though, to overhear my mother reprimand the old man. He is after all older than her and if this were a Chinese cultivation novel, it would be seen as heresy. Anakin prepares to leave the shop while getting C-3PO to continue where he had left off, so he could casually catch up with the group that had left. Got to keep making an appearance to reinforce the idea I am somehow connected or destined to meet Qui-Gon and Padme in some way. Makes it all the easier for me. Here you will like these pallies. Anakin has directed the group to one of the people he has come to have a warm relationship with since his rebirth, that the original also had as well. He gives Qui-Gon who seems distracted one of the offered fruit, giving another to Jar Jar, while Padme politely refuses. At the hip of Qui-Gon Anakin spots a lightsaber hanging at his waist as Qui-Gon puts the fruit into a pocket. Cool looking enough. Can't wait to have one, if not multiple of my very own. The old kindly woman at the stall the group had stopped at was Jira, a human female from Tatooine. The elderly Jira sold fruits, such as Pallies, in the Mos Espa marketplace, and had become a friend of Anakin's, because she became sort of a grandmotherly figure. She likes to refer to Anakin as the kindest boy in the galaxy. Which is not too much different from what she said of the original, but Anakin is very much different. Anakin had tried to convince her to move in with his mother and himself, but the stubborn old woman had refused. Anakin thinks to himself. I would not call myself the kindest boy in the galaxy, but I believe I have done my fair share of kindness. Helping free some slaves providing them with the necessary skills or employing them to work in my company, if only as basic manual labor. It is better than being a slave. Anakin continuously thinks to himself. At least she wasn't some slave and could make a decent living for herself. She had been selling fruits in this marketplace for quite a while. Oh, my gird's raking. Storm's coming up Ani, you better get home quick. Jira forewarns Anakin. Thank you Jira. You should too. Anakin replies before turning to the group and directing a question towards. Do you have shelter? We will head back to our ship. Qui-Gon replies. Is it far, perhaps in the outskirts? Anakin asks in return. Padman interjects. It is on the outskirts. I suggest you guys do not go into the outskirts at this time. Sandstorms are very dangerous especially on a planet like Tatooine, and you guys would never make it back before it reaches that point. Anakin warns then continues. I can offer you guys some shelter for now. My mother is kind enough to at least allow you guys some shelter from a storm. Walking through the streets of Moses but the group follows Anakin, as the storm continuously gets worse and worse with the group and other people still out in the streets a hard time not getting sand in their eyes. The group cannot see it, but the housing complex they have come across used to house slaves, but since those slaves have now become free, Anakin decided to buy up the surrounding lands here, and decided to redecorate. What once was a bland and rather sparse and basic living quarters have now become decent enough for an entire community to develop, and one has. The slaves now have come to live here and are protected under Anakin as his employees, but of course not everyone decided to stay on this planet. The ones that have stayed though have taken up residence in the various building throughout the distract. Anakin leads the group towards a door larger than any standard door, because Anakin has taken into account his potential height when considering the measurements. Upon opening the door within the group is greeted with a simple home that is quite spacious, compared to how it was last seen, with two extra stories above and a basement below. The house has signature Tatooine architecture, but other than this there are a few extra guest rooms throughout, and various other rooms that Anakin wanted for his workout regiments. Anakin enters first followed by Jar Jar, Qui-Gon, Padma and R2-D2. Mother. Mother. I have arrived. Anakin projects his voice into the house so his mother could hear him. Shmai hearing her son has come home promptly walks downstairs to greet her son, but is instead surprised at him not only her son, but the very same customers that had come to their store earlier. She knew she had taught her son to be kind, but what she didn't expect was for her son to welcome in the very same people, specifically the man she had talked to and scolded. Shmai holds her surprise well though while Qui-Gon gets over the shock of seeing the very same woman that had told him off. Qui-Gon looks away for a moment before deciding to properly introduce himself. I am Qui-Gon Jin. Anakin decides to drag off Padme with him into the basement, saying something along the lines of. I am quite excited I have some friends over. I guess it is time to show you to some interesting stuff, do you mind? R2-D2 decides to follow them both. While that is happening in the background Qui-Gon explains to Shmai. I'm guessing he is your son. Your son was kind enough to offer us shelter. 
While Anakin goes off to entertain Padm for a while the message sent from the people of Naboo is being played and projected for the Queen to see. The counselor that had been left behind was shown through a holographic view, explaining what has currently been happening in a desperate voice. The death toll has been catastrophic. I must bow to their wishes and you must contact me. Just before the holographic recorded message dissipates, Obi-Wan stands up at the same time directing towards the Queen. It's a trick. Send no reply. Send no transmissions of any kind. Obi-Wan walks off to inform his master of the message. Qui-Gon speaking into the handheld communication device says. It sounds like bait to establish a connection trace. What if it is true and the people are dying? Obi-Wan says in an asking tone. Either way we are running out of time. Qui-Gon replies. Night cycle, Coruscant. Tatooine is sparsely populated. If the trace was correct I will find them quickly master. The hooded figure of Darth Maul says his master, Sith Lord Sidious, whilst walking a step behind them. Move against the GD first. You will then have no difficulty in tacking the Queen to Naboo to sign the treaty. At last we will reveal ourselves to the GD. At last we will have revenge. Darth Maul with his hood on directs to his master. You have well trained my young apprentice. They will be no match for you. Darth Sidious praises his apprentice Darth Maul, encouraging him in his endeavor to come. Back on Tatooine, the sandstorm has not settled down and is still continuously going on with no end in sight. Back inside the dining room with Qui-Gon, Jar Jar, Padm, Shmai, Anakin and R2-D2 off to the site, a conversation is taking place where Shmai is directing it towards the group. The group was currently having a lovely dinner. We used to be slaves once, my son and I, but a mysterious benefactor had helped us out of our bleak situation, which led to the both of us becoming free. Shmai states. All slaves have a transmitter placed inside their body somewhere. Ani and myself had it extracted from ourselves once we had gained freedom. Shmai continued. I have built a scanner to locate where the transmitter is placed. Usually they implant it into the back of one's skull or head. It is a location that is hard to detect the transmitter, and other spots I have found is the transmitter being placed next to some of the slaves' hearts. Anakin spoke up. Usually any attempt to escape Shmai says before getting cut off by Anakin. They detonate the device inside a person instantaneously explodes ending a person right then, right there. Anakin decides to draw out the conversation to not listen to Jar Jar open his mouth to say his infamous line, how rude. But of course it failures and Jar Jar still thinks up to comment about what Shmai and Anakin were explaining. Padme in a disbelieving tone says. I can't believe there is still slavery in the galaxy. The Republic's anti-slavery laws or the Republic doesn't exist out here. We must survive on our own. Shmai stops Padme before she goes on a rant. What I want to know to get us out of this depressing conversation is has anyone seen a Padras before? Anakin questions. There is Padrasing on Malister. Very fast, very dangerous. Technically from what I know from current history, there has been no other human that could pilot and participate in a Padras. I have raced before so I believe myself to be the only human that could do it. Anakin says further implanting the idea that he is different from the average human child. Qui-Gon is still trying to get over that the teen no boy is 9 years of age. Qui-Gon tells Anakin. You must have GD reflexes if you race pods. There are no fruit for Jar Jar to swing his tongue around at so no comment is made about his annoyingness. I would like to ask a question. Anakin directs to Qui-Gon. Sure ask away. You are a GD knight, aren't you? Anakin uses the same line as the original. What makes you think that? Qui-Gon asks. I may have happened to catch a glance at the lightsaber clipped to the belt around your waist, and only the GD carry that kind of weapon. Perhaps I have killed a GD and took it from him. Qui-Gon says in a playful tone. I doubt that, there have been no recent GD deaths within the last few decades at least by the hands of another that I know of. Anakin states while thinking at the same time. But I do know of a recent GD death just not at the hands of a random ordinary person. A GD died to a Sith, or more specifically a GD was slain by Darth Maul which was his first kill so to speak. That is true, but I wish there would be no death within the GD. Qui-Gon says with subtle sadness. I once had dreamed about being a GD, going and training then coming back to free all of the slaves of Tatooine. Possibly even further beyond. Anakin states. Have the GD finally come here to help free the slaves of this planet? Anakin further questions. No I am afraid not. Qui-Gon states. Then why else would the GD be here? Another mission of sorts? I can see that I cannot fool you Anakin. We are on our way to Coruscant, the central system of the Republic on a very important mission. Qui-Gon decides to spill the beans. Anakin decides to ask the important question. Well then how did you guys end up here? In the outer rim. Our ship was damaged and we are stranded here until we can repair it. Padme answers Anakin. Bonnie, they had come to our shop to get the replacement parts to repair their ship, unfortunately I did not help them here, because they did not have any proper currency. Shmai interjects. Well mother, why don't we help our friends here they seem to have a very important reason to hurry and go. Anakin pleads with some genuine concern, but not for the reasons the others might suspect. How else am I to become a GD? I cannot do that. That would just have to come up with another method to pay. I cannot do that. 
That would just have to come up with another method to pay. Shmai said. There are ways we could expedite this process, an example being that a solution to your current predicament is to gamble, as the people here love gambling so much it has become a part of their culture. But I doubt that would be done in a short period of time, and you guys want to escape as fast as possible, so there are other options like trying to sell off whatever you own. Anakin continues. In fact you could go so far as to sell the broken down ship you have for a much worse quality ship. I am sure it would be faster than the repairs. While that may be true, I don't believe our current employer would like for us to get rid of the ship. Qui-Gon says in reply. Our company does and can supply you with another ship, obviously it depends on your make, model and the exact damage is done, but I am sure we could possibly help you out here. Shmai decides to add her input. And I was of the opinion you wouldn't have my business? Qui-Gon says with his eyebrows quirked. Shmai is a mother after all, and she very much loves her son, so even at the slight suggestions that Anakin was suggesting that she would be swayed and go along with his line of thought. Of course her own opinion had changed as well, after getting to know the reason of why Kwai Gon and his group only had Republic credits available to him, even if she were not fully aware of the severity of their situation. Please, forgive my mother she has had a lot of experiences that have shaped the way she would interact with unruly customers. Anakin said. Some of those times these customers were in fact trying to swindle her, and sometimes they have come at her with deadly intent. Well, it is in my nature and that of the GD to be forgiving. So I do not take it to heart. Kwai Gon replies. Padden decides to ask a question. You guys are not properly protected here? Are there no laws here on Tatooine that stops these kinds of things from happening? The thing is this planet is run by a criminal. The huts are not kind and a lot of unruly characters come to this planet. Anakin answered. A few years back it was much more common as my mother and I were practically alone when our business had started up, and we had very little protection from these encounters. Fortunately I had droids to take care of most of the more problematic situations, and had started to install security measures into the shop to protect my mother. Anakin thought. Otherwise I would have regretted it many times over. Being prepared is a great thing. It is better to have something and not not need it, than it is to not have something and eat it. That is true, but a lot of these slowly become less inclined to happen towards us, as we grew in size both in economic and political influence here on Tatooine. Shmai said. Technically we should be fully protected simply because the Huts value our business deeply. We have after all also become an official business under the Galactic Republic laws as well, letting us even open up shop on Coruscant. You guys could have left from here then? Pad masks? Yes. Why didn't you two leave then? It is much more complicated than it looks on the surface here on Tatooine, and in fact there is a lot of stuff brewing and going on that keeps my mother and I from leaving. Anakin says. That does not mean we do not want to leave, it just means there are still things left to do here. Qui-Gon decides to question Shmai. And your son? You do not want him to leave the Outer Rim territories and go towards a system that is much more well off. From what I understand this area is quite dangerous, and that fact is only reinforced by the lived experience that you two have lived. Anakin and myself no other relatives, I have nowhere to send him to. No one I could possibly trust with the safety of my child. Shmai says. The galaxy is just a dangerous despite me having absolute faith that Anakin would be alright, and has been when he took his own excursions off of Tatooine, I just knew he would be alright. It was as if I could sense it myself. Call it mother's instinct. Right? Qui-Gon says then thinks. This boy is weird. There is something about him, but I can't put my finger on it exactly, and my sense within the force tell me I do not really sense anything from the child. I should see if I could get any more information from the mother later. There are some other things that I have seen that could point towards Anakin being a force-sensitive child. Tell me about these other ships you two are willing to trade, and I will see if my employer is willing to trade in their ship in exchange for another. Just inform me about your decision. If it is otherwise declined I am sure there are other ways for you guys to get what you need. Shmai had fully embraced the businesswoman persona after many years of experience. This can be seen that she has started to still look for benefits in situations that she could gain from. This does not take away from her kindness, but has tempered it into a more practical way of giving without losing out for herself. She is not as selfless as she once was. I think we should continue eating and finish up here, you guys can hold up here for the night cycle here on Tatooine. I am sure that the sandstorm should be over by tomorrow morning. There were two native species to the planet of Tatooine, the Jawa and the Tusken Raiders. Both pesky and very unorganized in their ways with little to no communication that would happen between them and the locals of Tatooine. At least they were unorganized until a few years back when everything changed to where now Jawa were slowly being accepted into normal society on the sandy planet. This strange occurrence confused a lot of people especially the higher ups and investigations were done, but they could not discover the reasons as to why they had become a lot more sociable. What happened next were the Jawa now completely getting their very own stalls set up in the streets of Mos Espa, where they could sell their scavenged wares. The Tusken Raiders who were known to be the most violent and volatile between the two species had become much more subdued. Tusken Raiders no longer raided people and no longer did anything really negative against the locals across the various settlements on Tatooine. 
In fact the Jawa and Tuscans had taken to making their own communities. Advancing their civilizations past their current tribe-like states forming proper leadership and a proper society. Of course many things were still the same within their cultures, but it had been much better than before. All of these things was thanks to one person, Anakin Skywalker. Not that anyone would know of this fact, but many would be very thankful of this fact as it had caused less deaths to occur. Many had started to even pray to thank the deities above that they had been saved, mostly the moisture farmers were hit the worst. With great power, comes great responsibility. Or something like that. Anakin had taken his abilities he had developed to further better himself and the lives of those around him. He also helped out others indirectly, as well as could be seen through the control over the Jawas and Tuscans. Both of the species both feared and respected him as he had instilled in them that they should listen. It makes it all the more easier to take control of them and manipulate them into become better beings if he could communicate with them. Thankfully he had the ability to communicate with others directly through the mind. Telepathy is an ability that he had inadvertently developed because of his force techniques, mental arts of the mind, but he would have developed it either way as it was par for the course that a force sensitive would be capable of such things. Telepathic powers just made it easier for him to develop quicker and understand things at a faster rate. You guys will continue to stay loyal to me and no longer take unnecessary lives. Giving the group's commands was much easier than reasoning with them. Simply trying to ask would not work as it seemed they respected the strongest. Especially the Tuscans, they had practically started making statues resembling his frame and looks. Anakin obviously got them to hide those things or simply destroy them, because people may be able to identify he was the one responsible. Even if he has not made many public appearances, people should still be able to connect the dots, especially if someone who was force-sensitive or had the psychic capability to read the minds of the natives, were to catch their thoughts. So he had to go through the process of disguising himself to most of the species he now had control over, and only revealed himself to the leaders, as he had special materials that he could design and did create to shield their minds from intrusion. There were other things to take into account like his abundant take over the more low-key shady areas, and the lands they owned. He had taken over a lot from small-time criminals and shopkeepers that he could confirm were dirtbags of the highest order. He shouldn't just start a grand extermination on Tatooine when not everyone is guilty of crimes or actions he disliked. One such figure was Sebulba, he had practically driven him into a corner where he would only be able to live a life not really well. There were not a lot of things he could actually confirm himself, and Sebulba was too much of an infamous figure to outright be taken out. But soon enough he would be able to take care of him in an opportune time when no one would be looking. The Jawa and Tuscan had been set up in some shops he had taken over. Officially they had been working their own independent businesses while he was in control in the background, so he could collect information from them of criminal activity. This created a network throughout Tatooine as who would expect these species who could not communicate with anyone other than designated droids Anakin created to allow exchanges to happen between them and normal people to happen. These shops weren't just simple fronts for a large information network used to help him locate slaves and free them if possible, but also get information on a lot more other things as well. The underground is not that hard to access, but it is better to have another do this dirty work for him instead. Master. A voice spoke into his head. Oh. HK, why did you contact me? Anakin spoke back. Let's introduce one of Anakin's special made droids that would be considered living. HK-47 is capable of using the force just like any other force sensitive, just to a limited extent. An experiment of sorts at the start, but it turned into a fully capable route to increasing the strength of his military might. Imagine fully capable droids with their own freedoms from outside the rules of their programming, giving them a better ability to adapt. But this is not enough, not for Anakin. Being made to be able to use the force is an even better option, because with their newfound sense of life, they could feel just as much as the average living being could. They were under his control of course, he wouldn't want any problems to impede him. Thankfully the droids themselves do not mind being connected to him and following his orders. It is not like he abuses them for his own purposes all that often anyway, if at all. I have set everything up, the process in which Sebulpa would be killed will be successful with little to no chance of failure. Thanks HK. You have done a job well done you can get back to protecting my mother. Anakin despite a lot of protections put in place, had even put his first droid being given life to serve and protect his mother. It is the most advanced of the bunch and the longest living, in fact it is the very first of his special creations, making it the head honcho above the rest. HK takes pride in this fact. Weird bunch those elite droids. Now it is time to help Qui-Gon on his journey, but I know I could have an impact in the coming events, so it would be best if I joined them. Saving lives when I know I could save them, but I don doesn't sit right with me. Even if I am no hero or villain I should at least continue to save some innocents, maybe I would get some karmic points in exchange to make me lucky in the future. The Pottersing event took place as normal just without the participation of Anakin, which would have originally led to Sebulba winning the race with his dirty tricks, if there were not something waiting on standby to take his life. Target confirmed. Target is within sights, should the shot be fired? Confirm, fire the shot. And with the command Sebulba's life had come to an end in a very climatic but anticlimactic way. 
While the Pottersing event is going on, Qui-Gon had been trying to haggle with the Queen back on the Naboo Royal Cruiser to give up on the ship and let them get a new one. Your Highness, surely you must understand our current predicament. That is a no, GD Knight Qui-Gon. I will not trade in this ship, it would be too dangerous, and I would not be able to receive any transmissions from my people. The Queen replied. Padden was with Qui-Gon watching this event take place. That is right, I believe it prudent we find another way, but this GD is so insistent in trading with the kid and his mother. I admit I had thought he was cute at first, which he still is, but it is besides the point. Padden was upset at the two for refusing to help even when she knows the reasoning behind their logic. My people could be dying. Logically Anakin and Shmai would not know that the group had traveled from Naboo to Tatooine to escape from and to put a stop to an invasion on that planet. But the real queen, Padden was emotionally charged from the situation, especially knowing that something wrong could have happened. Every second counts, time is not money in this instance, times is the lives of her people. It is true a few of her people had been killed, but that was because a resistance had been formed, and in retaliation, the Trade Federation had replied in kind. They had not killed any hostages, the ones who had surrendered, but the people who resisted their occupation. The resistance was a bit dumb in this instance, given the Nemoidians from the Trade Federation would not hesitate to kill if they are deemed a hostile threat. Even more so that the droids programming is not perfect and could also see people who have weapons as dangerous. The queen on the other side of the communicator then asks Qui-Gon a question. Would these two individuals be willing to talk about it more? Perhaps a negotiations of sorts where we could give them an IOU card type of situation. That is possible, but I am unsure that they would accept such an offer. We can promise then a great many things and I am sure if they are a part of the criminals on this planet, they wouldn't mind having more money. While that may be true, I don't believe them to be born and breed the same way those on this planet usually are. In fact they used to be slaves. Slaves? That is right, the boy and his mother were slaves at some point, but had somehow escaped their situation and look at them now. Quite the achievement and from what I have heard a lot of it, has been done from the accomplishments of the boy, with a few add-ins from his mother. I don't care for this, we must get that replacement part. The queen cuts off the communication device before Qui-Gon could say any more. Qui-Gon sighs before saying to his group. It seems that are out of luck then, the queen doesn't seem to like the idea of selling off the ship or even trading it in for another. We can try other avenues, but I will be sure to ask the boy and mother if it would be possible if we give them a promise. Qui-Gon continues. They did seem to calm down and trust us more after last night. Mesa thinks the two would listen. Thesa seemed like nice peoples. Yes Jar Jar, thank you for your input. Qui-Gon says exasperated. Re-entering the storefront Qui-Gon could not see the boy anywhere in sight, but a droid working the counter. That droid seems like a protocol type. Walking towards the protocol droid Qui-Gon asks it if Shmai Skywalker is in. I would like to speak to Shmai Skywalker please. Why yes. The madam is indeed within the building, would you like me to call her for you? The protocol droids walks off and Shmai approaches Qui-Gon. So, have you guys figured out what you want to do? Well, it is a bit complicated, and it seems that negotiations have failed. Qui-Gon also thinks right after that. I seem to be failing negotiations a lot recently. Is this some sort of sign that I shouldn't be sent on missions to do with diplomacy? Well, that is unfortunate, but if you have no other way, no other money or anything to trade, then I would be unable to help you. Shmai says, but feeling there is more to the story questions Qui-Gon for a more in-depth answer. Can you tell me more about your mission you have been sent on? The details of why your ship has been damaged because if I did not know any better I would say you were being chased. Getting right to the point of her suspicions as she had seen the same types of situations before where she had to take in runaway slaves to shield them from any bounty hunters. Or worse slave hunters. Slaves were only recently able to start making their way out of slavery, in part due to Anakin's special invention to locate the chips implanted into them. With a way out why wouldn't they take it, but actions have consequences. This led to the creation of slave hunters that would track down runaways and would kill them, not capture like a bounty hunter could do if the mission allowed it, but kill them simply because that is their only goal. Well, I really shouldn't, but if you promise me that you do not inform anyone else I would appreciate it. Sure, I can promise you that. I have been sent from the Senate on a mission to help protect the Queen of Naboo, where at first it should have been a negotiation, it has now turned into a full-on invasion of their people. Qui-Gon states. Padme here is a part of this people herself, and we are looking for some help so we could go to the Senate. Please, I would be truly in your debt if you allow me to have the part we are looking for to repair our ship. Padme interjects with a little emotion seeping through her voice. It is possibly that delaying any longer could cause a lot of death or destruction to the planet or the people living there. Qui-Gon continues to persuade Shmai. Her conflict gone and her stance now changed, Shmai cannot allow atrocity to happen, simply because she was unwilling to help in a great time of need. Even if a lot of her selflessness has been toned down at heart that is who she is, I, I guess I can help you guys then. I will give you the parts, but I at least expect to gain something out of this in exchange, considering you guys are quite desperate I think I will just take what you originally offered. Padme's eyes light up at what was just said while Qui-Gon smiles and says. Thank you. 
I truly appreciate this. No, we truly appreciate this. Padm interjects. Right, do you guys need any help in getting everything you need to your ship? I have a few droids I could spare to help the process along. That would be most appreciated. Knowing that lives are at stake, everyone doesn't waste any time and get to work quickly in transporting everything. With everything that had taken place, it would take an entire day to get everything over and have everything properly repaired as it takes times to do so. While this is happening, Anakin was coordinating his own droids into stealthily boarding the droid control flagship of the Trade Federation. This will help me maintain and have a greater control over the droids. The Trade Federation's flagship was not that easy to get around, but by having his elite droid on the job, they could enter one of the authorized ships that has access to the ship. Through his droids, specifically his elite droids, he would be able to sabotage the communications between those on the planet and on the ship to stop any information flow traveling between the two. He is also able to use his own force-related abilities through them. The special connection he has allows him to do this, and with multiple elite droid on the flagship, he can speed the process up in taking it over. He would use Meku Daru and slowly envelop the ship with his force energy and alter the very being of the ship to work for him. He would also try and get and recall the transportation ships down on the planet when the time is right to escape with everything. Whatever is left over he will just buy from the Naboo in the future, preferably after the invasion attempt is thwarted. Status Report Connecting to one of the living droids, Anakin asks for their current progress. Reporting to the Master We have been successful in integrating ourselves into the network and have had no trouble so far in getting into the right places. That is good. For now all you guys need to do is get in good positions that are in vital spots, so I could take control of the internal systems. Anakin mentally replies then continues. It is paramount that you guys for now remain undercover as the job you guys have will help me in saving the lives of others. Yes master. The mental reply of multiple droids come back. It is good you guys know the value of life. Just as I had given you guys the life you live now and granted you the abilities you guys possess you should remember that others are similar to you. Similar but different, different but similar in that you may not have a biological body in which to live with. But a mind and soul free to explore who you guys are. The droids were already starting to develop their own personalities and characters, but weirdly enough, their ideologies are always in line with himself. Anakin knew this was probably due to the factors of him creating them, infusing them with his own force energy and their treatment and development, but what he would not have figured out was the extent of their worship of him could become. Anyway, Anakin had been using a lot of energy, time and effort into acquiring the droid control ship, knowing that it would not be an easy steal. If possible he would like to take the entire fleet, but he doesn't have enough training or what he considers force power or energy to get through every single ship within a small time frame. He would already be cutting it close with the flagship. Anakin? Would you mind coming down here for a second? Shmai voice calls up to Anakin who is within his room meditating. Sure. Anakin replies and walks downstairs, only to see that Qui-Gon is present and seems strangely happy. It seems my mother has given them what they want. Well it doesn't matter too much, I would have helped them one way or another simply for my own benefit if nothing else. Ani, Mr. Qui-Gon here would like to conduct a test of sorts. A test. He says it is a small exam meant to see your potential as a GD, he is interested in having you join the order. Really? Anakin says slightly surprised. I thought that without much evidence to go off of, no one would be any wiser about my capabilities, but it seems Qui-Gon was able to pick up on the fact I am strange for a child my age. Even if I was to go off of one of my strange traits, like advanced intelligence and maturity or my body developing quicker than normal. Yes. If you are interested in joining it would not be the same as the life you currently live. It would be similar in most aspects, but it would be tough to pull through with it. Qui-Gon states. Most children your age wouldn't be accepted, but I am sure an exception could be made. I do have some interest. I think we should do the test first, we can talk it over after you do have the capacity to use the force in full effect. Sitting down to take the test, the usual events happen after that with Qui-Gon calling back to talk with Obi-Wan about the test results coming in over the normal limit that simple equipment is used to test for. Even other devices don't go over the 20,000 midi-chlorian limit, so Anakin would not be able to determine his actual midi-chlorian account with this technology and would have to create his own to accommodate to his needs. It is quite late, I think we should talk about this more tomorrow. Yes, Ani I think you should head off to bed now. Okay, good night mother. Good night Mr. Qui-Gon. Anakin says heading back upstairs. Should I join the GD? There is a lot of things I could get from them, a lot of people that could be led astray so to speak and into my own academy I would set up. This subject can be thought about at another time, for now some rest should do. Well, my version of rest anyway. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.